everybody and welcome back to another episode of Learn by Play. We're back here with the Encounter Roleplay crew for our second episode of this season. We've got everyone back of us today, so let's get around the casting crew. Let's figure out who we are and who we're playing first of all. We've got Tall School with us today. Tall School, how are you doing? I am doing great. I am looking forward to this. Uh, see how we sort of get out of this little bit of a bind that we found ourselves in. But uh, could be more excited to be back playing uh, here on the D&D &D channel with Learn by Play. Uh, I am playing one Miguel Otanaba, who is from uh, Mazteca and is here to find a name for himself and enjoy all things that life has to offer. Amazing. We also have Sydney with us tonight. Sydney, how are you doing? I am great. I'm super excited. Last week was so much fun. And so I'm really ready to get back into it. I'm playing uh, Farron Holling, who is a half sun elf fighter um, from the circus, sharpshooter, all, all of those things, thigh, rubber, murderer. Rubber on the things. oil, yes. Rubber on the oil. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, speaking of which, we have Greg of us today. Greg, how are you doing, my friend? <laughs> I'm doing well, buddy. I'm doing well with that type of intro. We are back on D&D &D Wizards of the Coast, playing a little learn by play, reinventing the realms, getting into trouble and smothering people. It is beautiful. It is brilliant. Get out your Miguelaboo. It's time to take a drink. I will be playing Zephyr, the Air Genasi Barbarian, and I can't wait to get started. Let's do this. Incredible. And last but not least, we have Chelsea with us today. Chelsea, how you doing? I am stoked to be here. Uh, I echo all the things these other beautiful people have said, so um, I won't say it again. So we are, I know we're all stoked. We have just like chatted all week about how excited we are. Um, I am coming back to play uh, Rufus uh, Bigby. He's a giant 320-pound uh, man. Uh, and uh, yeah, he has recently escaped his life, his abusive life in the circus, um, and is trying to get back on the road as a traveling monk. Amazing, amazing. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing here on Learn by Play in case you guys are new. Learn by Play uh, is actual play show, of course. We're starting here at level one um, and we're going on a fantastic adventure uh, in the realms, the Forgotten Realms, but slightly different because in this show we take moments away from the game uh, to go over to here where the two insights are uh, and I talk to you guys one on one in sections about different aspects of uh, creating homebrew worlds and running your own games uh, in D&D 5th edition. Each week we take on a different topic. This topic of the week is going to be factions. We're going to be talking about different factions in Dungeons and & Dragons and particularly in the realms. Ones that we've encountered, ones that we're yet to encounter. I've even got a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, it takes me back, my friends. You guys, get ready. Uh, but let's remind ourselves of what happened last time on the show because we had uh, a very eventful first uh, episode of this uh, season. Uh, the party, um, we started with Miguel, of course, um, with Sindra Sylvain over in Port Nianzaru, uh, who was helping, uh, to try and solve some of the problems that have been going on in the Sword Coast during the Death Curse. Uh, Miguel ran into a couple of new friends over there, who we now know to be members of the Zentarim, uh, and, uh, managed to charm his way out of a bit of a difficult scenario. Uh, he then found Zephyr in a tavern in Neverwinter uh, with one of our uh, new friends, Mutt, uh, who is, uh, he puts Latenda in Bartender. Uh, he's a lovable half-orc who helped Zephyr and Miguel connect together. And they went on to find Farron and Rufus over at the circus just outside of Neverwinter. And um, <laughs> that was a whole thing. Um, there was oil rubbing into thighs uh you guys really have to go back and, and watch that one to to believe it uh and they ended up getting into a scenario in which they tried to kill the circus master after they were sort of teased into doing so by a, uh, a gentleman with long very long blonde hair who uh, wrote them up a, a murder contract basically uh through a series of shenanigans uh Ferrin and rufus managed to kill the circus master uh, making it look like it was just a, uh, an, an act upon the stage. Uh, Zephyr and Miguel had a bet on whether or not uh, he was actually dead. Turned out he definitely was with an arrow in the face. Uh, and uh, they then, as they were kind of convening the party and, and getting together to, to form their task, um, <laughs> they ran into Sergeant Tasker, uh, who is a, uh, an investigator from, the, from Neverwinter. 
Um, and uh, a member of the Guard Force there. And he's investigating the Circus Master, who apparently has criminal connections and was meant to give them a great deal of information today. Uh, unfortunately, he is, of course, now dead. Uh, and Sergeant Tasker was convinced by the ever-lovable Miguel to head down to the tavern with him uh, and get a few drinks before talking to the Circus Master, who, of course, <laughs> he's not doing any talking anymore. Uh, Miguel and Sergeant Tasker went to the tavern, got a few drinks, went upstairs, uh, and were confronted by a couple of tabaxi, four of them to be precise, uh, who revealed themselves to be members of the center rim, uh, who wanted Sergeant Tasker dead, basically, because he knew too much. Miguel, in a stunning display of uh, deception and treachery, uh, made uh, killed Sergeant Tasker, almost killed him. Uh, the tabaxi left, and then Miguel healed Sergeant Tasker, uh, in order to get him back. He is now choking up on the, the floor of the tavern, um, still alive, just uh, just having his life in his hands. And the rest of the party, Rufus, Zephyr, and Ferrin, have uh, returned to the tavern just in time to meet the four tabaxi members of the Zentrim, uh, who have just stepped out and seem to recognize the party. So, that's pretty much what we're going to pick up on today's game. We're going to jump right into the action and um, <laughs> and get into things. Uh, Miguel was upstairs with Sergeant Tasker in the tavern. Um, Sergeant Tasker is not feeling too well, but he's alive at least. And uh, Farron, Zephyr, and Rufus are just arriving at the tavern um, as four tabaxi members of the Zentrum, armed of course, come out and one of them just said, ah, exactly what we're looking for. So we're gonna kick things off with initiative. Let's go. <laughs> Oh no. Episode 2. What, wait, what? Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> what? Oh God, what? That was there's no talking, there's just initiative. These guys are going for it. They draw their swords, and they're coming towards uh, you. You can try and talk to them, of course. Oh, okay, good. But they may can talk to you while they murder you. <laughs> Should I roll just in case, or am I out of earshot and everything? Uh, you can roll initiative here. Yeah, of course, upstairs. It's gonna take you a little while to get up there. Uh, all right, so let's see. Uh, Zephyr, what did you roll here on your initiative? Thirteen. Thirteen. Beautiful. Uh, Rufus, what about you? I rolled a sixteen. Ah. Swift. Uh, Ferrin. Uh, fourteen. Fourteen. Miguelabu. That'd be an eight. Ah, uh, well fitting. He's a little <laughs> bit slower, I guess, at the moment. Oh, he's further away. Reacting to what's going on. All right, this guy's got a seven, so even worse. All right, so we have a turn order here, looking like Rufus, Ferrin, Zephyr, Miguel, and these four members of the Zentrim who are before you. Uh, tabaxi, all of them, and they look particularly cruel and unwilling to converse with you, other than with their swords. So Rufus, at this point, you're about you know ten feet away from these guys. They've literally just stepped out of the tavern. They see you, they draw your sword, they draw their swords, they don't draw your swords. Um, and uh, they're out for blood. So Rufus, what do you do? Um, I say stop! Uh, uh, why have you drawn your swords? Please don't make me hurt you! Because we're going to kill you! Well, did I more to have to hurt you? Um, Alright and... then, <laughs> fine. <laughs> he steps in with the kind of quarterstaff that he, uh, he carries, and he says, Bad kitty! 18! Ah, to hit. An 18 is definitely a hit on this, uh, you know, the lead tabaxi guy, um, who, uh, he's a guy that tried to slit, um, Sergeant Tesco's throat. He seems the most talkative member of them. Uh, but you definitely smack him. Smack him right in his tabaxi face. <laughs> I said, <s> stop. <laughs> <laughs> you make a convincing argument. Uh, and he does stop for a moment as you smack him in the face of the corner stuff. You're not going to kill him, but you're certainly going to hurt him. Um, how does Rufus do this? Um, yeah, he like swings it big around his head and whacks him upside the face with it, uh, dealing that bludgeoning damage um, nice. to his cute little face. Just takes his little face. Ah! Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Ferrin, you watch as Rufus just smacks his corner stuff into the face of the nearest tabaxi. Uh, yeah, um, she, so Farron feels very protective over Rufus, so this will sort of, like, spark, like, uh, an immediate concern and uh, then a cause for a reaction, and she's like, don't, he's, he's very sensitive, and, um, she'll pull out, like, her rapier and just, like, do the same thing, this is not really something that she's very trained with, so it might be a little bit sloppy, but let's try it. All right. Seven. 
seven is not quite enough. The Tabaxi That's... manages to swat away uh, your blade with his own. Yeah, I had a, had a feeling that would happen. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Whew, Zephyr. Okay, so as soon as it becomes evident that violence is imminent, uh, Zephyr begins to stride forward, and as he's walking directly at the pack of them, he reaches up and unclips an eye hook that releases both his cape and it releases the leather gun rig that he wears underneath his outfit. And as he reaches behind him, he catches the shield as it falls and reaches under his left armpit and pulls out a war hammer as the great sword clatters to the ground behind him. But with each step, it's something that his captain, his former mother called, his former mother called his blessed unrest as a storm begins to build in his eyes and you see lightning strikes and clouds start to creep out of his mouth and ears and his eyes as each step gets him more and more engaged in his blessed unrest. And as he walks directly up to the one that was talking, the one that seems to be the mouthiest, he looks directly into its eyes and says, you made quite a mistake here today, puss puss. And he attacks. See it. As I roll in that one. Pull in that one, yeah. <laughs> right. If I can find my own finish. Uh, 12. A 12 isn't enough. Right. The, well, I mean, he's I'm into nimbly, him, though. I, yeah. I want to be in him, yeah. Yeah, he just kind of has at you and, like, pounces out of the way, uh, spry on his uh, the balls of his feet, jumping away from the Warhammer. These guys are pretty fast. Uh, Miguel, upstairs, you hear um, sounds of combat down below. You hear the sound of a Roar! from Rufus as he smack of wood into someone's face. You can look out the window and you can actually see these guys flying down there. Ooh, um, cool. So uh, Miguel will uh, reach into one of his pouches and pull out uh, three uh, stones from his uh, homeland and uh, begin chanting over top of them and casts uh, magic stone on them. Are they within 60 feet? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so I am going to w take one of these stones and then I just wing it down at them as hard as I can. Nice. Uh, that's a 21. A 21 is definitely a hit. Uh, and the stone will hit, uh, I'll say, uh, one of the guards, one of these guys who's not engaged with either Tiny or Zephyr mm -hmm. uh, with six bludgeoning. Nice, six bludgeoning. He kind of like feels on the back of his head ah, and turns uh, to look up at where your uh, window is. Uh, he's not happy with that at all. Uh, anything else you want to do, Miguel? Um, how far down is it? Uh, it's, you know, you're on like the first story. So, so you could uh, get down there. I yeah, mean, I'll do it. Can I do a check to? to yeah, get let's give down? you. Uh, let's give you an acrobatics here. Okay. Um, that's twenty-one. Uh, twenty-one's fine. Yeah, you uh, you you jump down there with a kind of fud uh, and uh, and land successfully. It's a pretty short little yeah. tavern, so uh, you don't have to worry about taking too much full damage there. Uh, all right, the Zents are going to take their turn. Uh, the lead guy is all up in Zephyr's grill. Uh, and it's going to try and hit him for that. Uh, a 19, Zephyr. One guess what my armor class is. <laughs> so uh, he's going to smack you uh, with that. And he just dives in with a short sword. Deals five damage to you. Okay, so uh, reduced to three or two? Uh, always run down, right? Oh, Math. yeah. So two? Uh, okay. So he just kind of stabs you. Doesn't manage to get. It, it looks like a much better hit than it, it truly was. Um, it looks like he's really going to open up your side, but it really just kind of furrows and uh, and clinks off some of the armor there. Uh, the second guy is going to take a shot at Ferrin, um, slicing at her with his own sword on a thirteen. Ferrin. No, oh, guess what my armor class is. Oh no, really? <laughs> yeah. Ah, die. Six damage is what you take. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Level one feels bad, man. Uh, yeah, that's not looking good. <laughs> one of them's, the one that got shot in the back of the head by Miguel is going to uh, turn and just, like, throw a uh, throwing dagger straight up in that window. See if he can get you. 
Uh, he's proficient in this. So, Miguel, a 13 versus your armor class. Misses. I have a four, I'm 14. Nice. Uh, it just kind of prongs into the, yeah. uh, the yeah, sideboard. Oh, so, gifts for me already. Why, well, thank you. We will talk with you again later. <laughs> Sergeant Tusk is like, what's happening? And then <laughs> dagger just fries up. Uh, and the last guy is going to uh, swipe back at Rufus. Uh, Rufus A. Ooh! Oh! oh, oh, oh. No! <laughs> I'm afraid so. <laughs> I'm afraid so. That is a natural right. 20. So, Rufus, right. seven points of damage. Could have been worse. Slashing the actual. Swipes at oh, you. Right. As if the short sword were an extension of his own claws and swipes across your face. It is the top of round two, and Rufus, it is your turn. Uh, he's going to reach out uh, and start with uh, his quarterstaff again, mm -hmm. and then he'll get his extra unarmed strike attack bonus uh, for being more short. So we're going to do both attacks this time. 15 to hit. 15 is going to do it. Yes. Die, kitty, die. Nice. Uh, he's not dead. He's very close to death. You, you're like pulping in the main guy's face right now. All right. And we'll do that, actually. Oh, double It crits. is meant to be. <laughs> Yeah, this is when you do the awesome description now, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so he brings the staff around um, and whacks him in the back of the head, catches him by the throat, and smashes him in the ground um, yeah, he, as he punches him in the face. He is so dead. <laughs> so he's just, yep. His dead, face dead. is so dead. And he says, don't you touch any of them, as he finishes them off. He's not going to touch anything or anyone anymore, uh, as his face just goes into a pulp and he falls back down on the ground dead. Uh, Farron, it's your turn. Yeah, okay, so Farron looks, um, like, very, very shocked at what she's just seen uh -huh. Rufus do, because she's sort of always known him as this, like, gentle giant. And she's like, oh, okay, I I'll, I'll try to do it that way. <laughs> and she, um, she'll try to attack with her rapier again, because she's too close to use her, uh, bow. Absolutely. A 16? 16 is a hit. <laughs> okay. With nine damage. Nine damage is enough to kill this guy in one. Uh, how does he go? Cool. Okay, so um, she um, she's very inspired by Rufus's just sudden rage and, and murderous triumph, and so she sees him. And she's like, oh, I'll try to do it like that. Um, and she like it's like looking at Rufus. She's like, like this, and whacks him, and he just like dies there. And she's like, <laughs> like waiting for approval. Yeah, he dies gargling in his own blood and falls down. And imagine her like floor. jumping like a cheerleader, like oh! <laughs> <laughs> terrifying. Uh, Zephyr, you got two of these okay. guys left on you. Uh, okay, so are they both? Um, they're at range with Miguel and everybody else. Am I the closest to? Can I engage in melee both of these guys? Uh, you can get to one of them. Yeah, can either get to the guy with less who got shot in the back of the head by Miguel or one who uh, hasn't taken any damage yet. Okay, uh, what I'll do is I'll just attack the leader again. I was gonna go for, to restrain, but. Okay, I think that guy's had his face smashed in by Rufus, but there's another guy there. Never mind. it is not my night. Ooh. As I get yeah, you just kind of boom, swing wildly, uh, and Tabaxi just ducks underneath the, uh, the blow as the uh, air parts by blowing his ears around. Uh, Miguel, it's your turn. Uh, you're muted, Torskull. So the guy that uh, I just uh, spoke, uh, who uh, I hit with a stone and threw a dagger at me, mm. I, I go, so you want to play with daggers? I do know how to play with daggers. And he pulls out two ceremonial daggers, one in each hand, and uh, with a flourish sort of spinning at him uh, with sort of all of his feathers and uh, colors flying like a giant uh, whirling dervish goes in uh, and is going to do both a main hand and an offhand dagger attack. Nice. So first dagger ooh, with a ooh. seven. He does not get it uh, offhand dagger with a 21. Uh, 21's enough. See, I was just distracting you with the main hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for four piercing, just nice. stick it right in. Yeah, you stick it into the uh, the, the throat of the, uh, the guy who shot in the back of the head and he dies just straight on the dagger, falls onto it. Uh, he looks very surprised he does so. Oh, oh, oh. Anything else, Miguel? Um, that is it, I believe. Alrighty. 
and that takes it to uh, the last guy standing, uh, who is going to look around him, <sighs> and he sees he's seen Rufus take a pretty bad hit, so he's going to go in on him. He's the biggest target around. Rufus is 17. Uh, do I get an attack of opportunity? Uh, he's going to uh, lob a dagger at him. Yes, okay. yes, 17 hits. Nice. Uh, be bad news bears. So, uh, dagger's a d4, right? Yeah. Four damage. You literally took every HP point I had left. <laughs> Rufus goes down. <sighs> Beautiful. No! <laughs> oh no. Face down. D dust goes. Nice. When his body hits. I think Rufus is the first to fall. Uh, yeah, good stuff. He just kind of like lobs his dagger at you, just past Zephyr uh, and Rufus. You take it and you fall over unconscious. That takes it to top of round three. Rufus, you can roll me a death saving throw. It's my knight! Oh, oh, damn. That's a deck save. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still a natural 20. <laughs> uh, what did you tell me to make? I'm sorry. I said a death saving throw. Sorry, not a deck saving throw. A deck saving throw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try again. No, it's all good. It's all good. The natural 20 is a natural 20 either way. Uh, so we'll, we'll count as Rufus, you come back up on a one. Uh, oh, okay. It's, I mean, uh. no matter what modifier it is, you still rolled the dice. So, uh, yeah, so Rufus, you come back up on one. Uh, you just kind of like pop back up again um, after this thing has uh, just flobbed a dagger and you kind of <gasps> come back up again on a natural 20. Alrighty. Uh. Farron. Okay. Um, yeah, she, she'll be. Uh, she's not engaged with this one, so I think I can actually go back. So I'll be able to use my longbow, right? Yep. I haven't been fighting this one, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take some steps back, clear my head, um, um, and she'll. She'll sort of like try and channel her and, and Rufus's routine, and you know, channel him so she can save him and um, uh, like pull out her longbow and uh, do some sort of fancy twist and. Get centered and let's try this. 15? 15. 15's enough. Oh, yes. Four damage. Four damage is enough to kill this guy. Oh. Do sink an arrow into him though, into his side. Ah! Yeah, and she she does that and then she like looks up and she's like, oh, um, Miguel, I, I didn't know you were here. <laughs> Did you did you see that? I'm so I'm so embarrassed. I wasn't even. <laughs> Rufus! Oh my God. She runs over to his body that's totally like flopped onto the ground, and like <laughs> puts her hand like on his face and like, "Are you okay?" Um. Well, I've got a dagger in the chest, so no, I'm not okay. Um. Should should I just try and and pull it out? Um, he coughs. I'll be there in a moment, lady. <laughs> and I give her a big smile. That's, that's I'm tiny trying to stop tiny. her from pulling the dagger in case that makes him bleed out. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait for you. All right, then. Uh, Zephyr, it's your turn. Uh, wasn't that the last guy that dropped, or are we do have another guy? Left. He's wait, wait. Yeah, he wait, I was going to say, yeah, um, I need to do... I need to use my bonus action, second wind, really quick, so I can okay. get some more HP. Otherwise, I'm gonna die. So just tell everybody, pardon me for a second, so I just don't die because I don't. Yeah, you still got okay. one guy left standing. Farron dealt full damage to him, but he's not down. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, this is the leader, right? He's he's long dead. Uh, Rufus like pummeled his face in. Oh the oh the leader went off. I was thought I was our leader. leader. Oh okay. Um, well, anyway, the, the one guy that's left, I am going to attempt to grapple him because I need all the extra dice rolls I can apparently get here to try and subdue this guy. So I'm going to wrap him up in a bear hug and try to, you know, get a, like a rear naked choke on him or something. So uh, <laughs> is that athletics contested? Correct? Yeah, you want to grapple him? Then, then yeah. Jeez, oh me. <laughs> You're on a five. Oh, really? Yep. Hey. So, uh, you managed to have him grappled. He's weak from the arrow shot to the, uh, the side, and still kind of recovering from that. 
uh, when Zephyr, you just kind of grab him and put him into a grapple. Okay, I kick his leg out and take him down to his knees and just, <laughs> you know, choke him out and, uh, you know, take the hammer and kind of rest the hilt of it across underneath his chin and uh, lift his neck up so he can see that, the you know, the big man that's down over there mm -hmm. and say, I told you you made a mistake, puss puss. And he just holds it, holds him where he is. All right, then Miguel, it is your turn. Uh, since he is now grappled and prone, do I have advantage on melee attacks? Uh, yeah. Although oh, technically grapple doesn't make you prone, we'll allow it. Oh, that's true too. So yeah, that was just flavor. So anyway, do I have advantage? If yeah, he's I'll, I'll give you advantage on this guy. He's okay. uh, on his so, last yeah, legs. I've got sure. both daggers out and uh, I, I go at it. 21. 21's enough. A four, and if he's not dead, I'll hit him. With, actually, I'm going to go in with both just because to make sure he's dead. And a 24 on the other one. That'll do it. So that's a little seven damage to him between my two daggers as I just come in, flip them around, and <laughs> right into him. He is so dead. As if it holds him there, just kind of dies from the uh, repeat uh, knife wounds to his body, and he yeah. passes out and dies. Uh, combat is over. Zephyr immediately goes over to where Rufus and uh, Farron are. Yep. Nice. Miguel follows. Rufus uh, struggles to breathe. He lets in this like kind of a uh, raspy <laughs> breath um, as if maybe it's punctured a lung or something and he <clears throat> coughs up some blood. <laughs> oh, my oh, my magnificent <laughs> friend. It is not your time yet. Miguel has you. And I pull the dagger out and use my one spell slot to cast your <laughs> wounds on him. Oh, man. Nice. Uh, good old level one. Uh, that's for seven healing. Fantastic. Fantastic. You are far too magnificent to be leaving us so soon. The night is young. He reaches up with his kind of like chunky hand and puts it against your beautiful man face uh, <laughs> and says, oh, um, I owe you. Thank you all for... for Healing me, how was it gonna? Not yet, my friend. We have much more, <clears throat> ah, many more drinks to drink in this life together, I believe. Uh, oh. Zephyr offers a hand down to Rufus as I'm assuming it's gonna take both he and Miguel to help <laughs> yeah. 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 like, him. Like, a little bit, yeah. We're gonna like get up behind him and like push like <laughs> from the back while you guys pull out push. Come on, big man. Come on, Peacock's got you. Come on. Hey, hey, oh! Uh, as you guys like manage, I guess, to pull him forward. He's a pretty big dude. I guess he is dexterous though. Yeah, he gets up all right. Make it up. <laughs> he like brushes himself off as if he's not wearing like the rattiest robes ever mm -hmm. um, as he stands next to Miguel. <sighs> My friends, we should head inside and get ourselves in a secure place. I have news. At this point, the tavern owner uh, is coming out and people from the tavern are kind of spilling out as you have basically had a big fight just outside the tavern and killed four people. The door kind of swings open and this dwarven lady uh, comes out, the proprietor of the bar. What is going on here? She looks at the four dead bodies, looks at you, the blood on your weapons. Sergeant Tasker will explain everything if you will just give me a moment to retrieve him. I think you're probably a persuasion check on this one. <laughs> I flash through the smile. Come on. Keep rolling like I did last week. 19. Nice. Yeah, she uh, she thinks about it for a second. If you didn't have such a beautiful man face, I wouldn't, but fine. Tell you what, we will uh, get these uh, this trash from out in front of your bar so it does not affect your business for the rest of the evening and be down for drinks. Uh, well into the night, I'm sure. Just get him out of here. So can we, like, drag them just someplace uh, so they're not literally in front of the tavern? Yeah, I mean, the tavern has, like, a, uh, you know, an alley on the side of it, which is, you know, reasonably dark uh, that you could take them to. And it also has, like, a back... It looks like a, like a beer garden area that no one's in at this point. Uh... So that's the, the immediate place. Um, you're basically in a small village, so you've got kind of like village cottages and huts around you right now. Um, there's not many. There's not many places around here. And of course, you're not far from a carnival either, so people are kind of like spilling out from the carnival. 
Um, Zephyr will yeah. pick two of them up by the scruffs of their neck and carry them into the alley. Rufus picks up the other two <laughs> by the neck. Miguel's just like, now there, <laughs> there is some feats of strength. Carrying two at one time. Hmm. Just looking at your legs. <laughs> it's, 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 it's Miguel back, right? <laughs> and Farron is like following Rufus, like, uh, for some reason behind him in case he falls as if she can catch him. <laughs> Are you sure you're not pushing yourself too much? You just had a dagger in your chest. I'd like nothing more than to dump these pussycats behind this building. They almost killed me. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah, I saw it and, and it was very scary, but now I'm, I'm worried that you're going to strain yourself and... and it's <laughs> Rufus, Rufus looks at her and says, Last time I checked, I smushed a rock earlier this evening with my bare hands, so I'll, I'll be all right. And he like pats her on the head in terms of her concern and care. It means a lot to him. Yeah. <laughs> Miguel puts his arm around Farron and gives her the smile. And oh. he goes, my dear, my touch is magical when it comes to healing. <laughs> <laughs> Rufus is, is oblivious is that, that you're coming on to Francis. <laughs> it's truly, it's magical. I felt his touch myself. <laughs> she like, that like, goes to like, almost touch your chest and is like, oh. <laughs> 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 we, we, we wanted to say thank you for, um, for what you did for Rufus there. And I know you don't know either of us very well, so that um, means a lot to, uh, to both of us. Yes, uh, don't thank me yet. We are in well over our heads here, my friends. Uh, once we get rid of these bodies, I need to fill you in on what happened earlier before you arrived. Yes, uh, Zephyr, who's probably a little bit more focused than the others, uh, looking at the bodies here. Um, Zephyr, you notice that there's something a little bit odd uh, about the bodies uh, of the four tabaxi who are before you. You notice that they've got a fair amount of sort of gang tattoos on them, which is pretty common for, you know, criminal uh, underworld connection types. Uh, however, you notice that one of the tattoos, uh, which is basically on their forearm, uh, seems to be like moving. It's like writhing. It moves on its own accord. And, uh, you know, fairly well hidden by the thick fur, which is on their arms. Um, but now that you've, you know, they've got wounds on them, you see them in the in full light, probably, uh, without having to, you know, block a sword coming in. You can see that all of them on their right arm have a, a kind of writhing tattoo on their arm. Um, I, I prepare to point it out to the others, but before I do that, I'd like to search them to see if they have any type of orders on them or money or anything that would be good to use absolutely they carry between them 16 gold pieces on their person but they do not appear to have any written orders on them okay i call over to the others hey check this out i have a lot of tattoos but none of them move and he points to the the arms of each of them and he pulls his great sword out of the rig that he's kind of picked back up and clipped back in. And before he puts his cape over, he pulls out his great sword and kind of lowers it over the one of the arms and looks back at everybody else with the raised eyebrow of, should I cut this off? Um, um, what, can I take a look and see, I mean, what is the tattoo of? Yeah, you take a look at it. Um, it's not something which you immediately recognize and it's actually very difficult to make out exactly what it is at first because it moves. Uh, and the more you look at it, it kind of gives you a headache. You know, uh, it seems to like writhe and and move and it's, the more you look at it, it kind of draws you in. Uh, and uh, it appears to be like slightly red, like a dark red sort of tattoo color to it, which is unusual. Uh, Cause you know, you'd think it'd probably just be like straight on black. It seems to be uh, dark red. Uh, and as far as you can tell, it seems to be some kind of skull. Uh, a skull which is on a body of some kind of serpent or some kind of worm, as far as you can see. Uh, the skull seems to like move and wind its way around, like a game of worm, right? Um, but the, the head of the, the snake is like this skull which is moving around and the body of it is serpent-like and or worm-like. And it slivers slowly. Oh, uh, Rufus walks over to where you've got your sword pointed, Zephyr, and, like, wants to take a look with his own eyes. And he touches the single tattoo he has in between his forehead, and he says, My tat has never moved. That makes me nervous. 
Me too, big man. You all right? He looks at Rufus and, you know, just to, he saw him fight and he did better than Zephyr did. He, you know, nods and in respect and he is actually genuinely concerned. Um, I don't usually hurt people and I've killed a lot of things tonight. Well, you know, so I just feel a little queasy. I could do the hot cup of tea. I, I don't feel like we really had much of a choice uh, in, you know, we, I mean, yes, we, we have killed multiple people today. <laughs> you have, you have quite a list going. But you think? There was definitely a choice involved in one of these people, wasn't there? <laughs> well, you see, it, well, the, the, the man gave us these weird uh, ultimatums and, and we couldn't, it, it, I'm, I'm starting to realize maybe it was a bad thing. I'm starting to feel a little bit guilty. And then... It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. We're hiding behind this bar. We've got to keep our voices down. we got dead cats in front of us. Um, and he looks, he looks at the tattoo. He says, do you think it's magical? I think it's moving. Most... Um, at this point, Will, can I look up and see if there's like a gathering cloud of smoke coming from back towards the carnival? Where? Oh yeah, we lit it. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That place is uh, is going up, and um, whilst people at first were just like moving away from it, people are running away from it now. Uh, this is this place is getting pretty out of control. There are some people going to fetch water, you know, pails of uh, water to try and fight the fire. But uh, yeah, there's definitely a blaze going up at the carnival. Uh. I look at Zephyr as he's pointing at this to cut it off, and I'm not sure if something like that, just cutting it off, will take care of it. I can attempt to burn it away, but I do not know if that will take care of it either. It looks like there's something under the skin, though. Something moving. Oh, yes. Don't you want to see what it is? No. Uh, it. Nope. It's... It's strange that it's still moving after they're dead. Right, that's why I'm wondering if we cut it off. If it did not, we'll still move. And it might run away. <sighs> uh, so something living under his arm? Is that what you're telling me? You think there's something living in him? I think so. <gasps> it looks like it. Looks like something. Looks like a, a puppy under a blanket. Look at that. And then he says, uh, he looks over at Farron and he says, hey, evil eye. Take a couple steps back, take the big man and the peacock. Aim down at this, I'll cut it off. Something Ruf, jumps. Ruf, Rufus says, wait, 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 what if we burn it off? If there's something I... under the skin, usually if you hate it, it'll, you know, leave you its host. I light up my hand with sacred flame and go, perhaps some a holy fire. No, oh, it is. God. And it, it's interesting. His uh, sacred flame is not yellow. It, it glows blue and red and, and gold, much like his eyes. I defer to you, Peacock. You should keep that sword ready, though. If it comes I, out, you've got to yes. step in. I think oh. I might take a couple steps back, just in case. I, I think I'm, I'm better suited over there. She backs away. She's like, Rufus, if you want to come with me, we can... Yeah, I'm going to just stand over here with the lady. Keep us safe. <laughs> Get it in, my friend. Let's see what's in there. So I drop Sacred Flame onto it. It's normally a deck save, but since he's dead, I think he automatically fails, okay, right? There's, there's no way he's uh, succeeding on a deck save anymore. He's not saving anything. Uh, yeah, you cast the Sacred Flame. Do you want it to do it onto the tattoo itself? Yeah, onto the tattoo now. I mean, it, yeah, onto the tattoo or whatever's moving, if whatever's moving isn't under the tattoo, sort of, I mean, the idea is, I mean, is it like the ink that's moving or is it like there's something underneath of there? It moving? looks like there could be something underneath there moving. So yeah, for some reason it's not lined up with the tattoo. I mean, I'm trying to hit whatever weird thing is there with Sacred Flame. Yeah, uh, feel free to roll that damage. Uh, that's five radiant. Yeah. You uh, hear this, this little scream come from the arm, basically. It's kind of, uh, and the tattoo on the arm stops writhing as you burn it away. And he's gone. What 
told you. I told you. It's not right what I'm used to hearing at night. <laughs> that gave me the heebie-jeebies. Is anybody else's hair standing on in? I don't even have any on top of my head. Oh, everywhere else is just... His arm was screaming. I... Well, the question now is, do we just... Do I burn the rest, or do you want to take a look at what it might be, my friend? Oh, I don't want to let... Yes. Do yes. it. Do it, Zephyr. <laughs> cut, cut it out. Ooh. All right, well... I'll be Fair. ready. Everyone get ready. We know it takes a little bit of fire to kill it, but, uh... Okay. Perhaps... Should we just leave one and get the other two gone? I would hate if all of a sudden we had three to deal with. Looks like we dispatched this one fairly easily while it was inside. Yeah, let's burn off the two. So, yeah, we burn off... Can we burn off the other two, Will, and then just save yep. one to try to cut out? I can roll up damage, or if we are... Uh, it's all good. You can burn them away pretty easily. Yeah, and so now we're all ready. So there's one last body with a writhing tattoo on it. Uh, Zephyr uses his boot and kind of grabs the wrist and pushes it out, kind of cracking it a little bit as he exposes the forearm, and he pulls his greatsword up over top, and with a eye back to the rest of them, he says, Get ready. This is going to be a surprise. And he drops the, the sword down and severs the arm. Nice. Uh, as you sever the arm, a uh, few things happen almost immediately. Uh, of course a few things happen. Zephyr, first of all, you can roll me a dexterity saving throw as something shoots out from the arm, along with arterial blood, which is, you know, still, like, in the arm. He's still, like, got blood coursing around him, though he's just died, you know. Blood begins to pour out, and something else shoots out as well. That's good. It's good news indeed. I have upset the Roll20 gods. Whatever I did, I apologize You're greatly. You're being punished for something. Uh, you take eight points of necrotic damage as this thing yeah. latches into your, basically your chest. Uh, you know, it just kind of shoots right up to your chest and it is like, you hear it scream, you hear, and it is just trying to worm its way inside your chest right now. Ooh, it's trying oh to eat God. its uh, way inside ooh. you. Can I, can I hit it with the sacred flames since I kind of had it prepared? Shoot it, shoot it. Yeah, let's do that. Oh my gosh. Oh. oh it's, I assume, it, does it make a dex save? I bet it does. Yeah, it can out, make right? a dexterity saving for it. I think it's pretty dexterous. Rolls an 18. Uh, Rufus steps in and I'm just gonna, I wanna pull it off of him. All right. Can I, can I grab it and pull it off? Yeah, roll me a, uh, roll me like an athletic save, like grapple a thing. At a 12. Nice. Uh, so he's going to try and grapple you back. It's not very good at grapple, but it succeeds. It is staying latched right into Zephyr. Oh Farron, you okay. get a chance oh. to do something here. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to... So this is what I'm going to do. Um, she, she knows that fire will uh, do something, so um, I'm going to take... I'm going to use prestidigitation. I'm going to whip out one of my swords from my um, explorer's pack, and uh, not my swords, a torch. I'm scared. <laughs> and light it, and just, like... I'm so sorry, but I'm going to, like, touch it to, like, his chest where it is and see if I can... Um, like burn it out with this torch that's lit. All right, uh, roll me like a dexterity based attack roll. No proficiency. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Give it one. <laughs> one second. <laughs> a six. Six is not enough. You like swipe out the thing, uh, but it just like it, it's pretty dexterous, and you don't want to get it too close to Zephyr so that you're gonna like burn through his chest basically so uh zephyr you get a chance to do something here before it's going to try and eat you they're trying to eat me okay uh Probably. well i would like to rage again <laughs> good idea <laughs> i'm gonna need this right now and i'm gonna try to uh i know it's a smaller creature so i should have this i'm gonna try to grapple it yeah with the intent to just hold it aloft and squeeze it I'm nice. gonna keep it away from my chest, so it's just. Do you, you want to like, like squeeze it till it's dead, or do you just want to hold it? I'm gonna try to incapacitate it if possible, but if squeezing it and it just snaps, then it just snaps because this thing is eating not you. Bueno. Yeah, it's it's in no bueno. So, so let's do the. Uh, so you should have advantage on this grapple check. There we go. And he rolls, he rolls a <gasps> nat one. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, actually on a nat one, you like snap something on it. Uh, like it, it, it's like wriggling into your chest. You just like pull it off with a, 
uh, and sucker it off. Uh, and you see this, like, this tiny little skull, essentially, like a skull of a rodent, that size. Uh, and it is, like, biting and gnawing and chewing, and the wormy kind of bottom of it is just, like, wriggling and writhing frantically in your hand. And you hear it kind of uh, as you, like, snap it off you, and it stops wriggling and writhing as it kind of... And it is dead. Um, oh. before it goes, is there any chance that I could, as I heard the crack, could I pull it up to my face and say, Who are you? And see if it answers. Just see if it can talk. It doesn't seem to be able to. You kind of like pull it up. It's like dying. It's kind of just <laughs> screaming as it dies. Oh. He throws it to the ground and just stomps the shit out of it. Just <laughs> and turns around. Okay, that one's on me. I was curious. Curiosity killed the cat. No pun intended. I've learned my lesson. R Rufus goes, I think I'm gonna be sick. And he starts kind of like, oh. Oh. oh God, I, I think we probably need to take Rufus inside and maybe give him some tea I, or something. He, he. I hand Rufus my bottle of Malibu and I'm like, this will help. <laughs> <laughs> it looks tiny in his hand and he like, whoop, 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 you know, like passes it back half full. Yeah, Miguel's like, as <laughs> he like chugged out his bottle. <laughs> I believe there's more inside. Shall we? Actually, we, I, I still, we, we need to get inside. We should, um, we should hide. You know, we didn't, you know, we did just burn down the, the freak show. There was an accident. <laughs> Miguel was like, you did what? No, we, we did There was an accident. Not. We witnessed an accident. That's true. We did it, burn it down. He did. Uh, uh, we, yeah, we, we accidentally witnessed him burn it to the ground. Right. Yes. That was, is that what we're saying? like these... Tabaxi accidentally fell on all of our weapons. Perhaps we should cover them up. Is there anything around that we can at least sort of throw them in a trash pile or something? Yeah, there are like barrels of, you know, stuff. Right, there's some empty barrels around here that you can chuck some bodies in. Uh, are you leaving the, uh, the weird undead worm thing on the ground? It's about like 12 to 15 inches in length. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I it, are we sure crazy. it's dead? It looks pretty damn dead. It's not moving. It's not writhing anymore. And it certainly has a ability grab, to like I'm going to grab it to bring it as evidence to Tosker. Tasker. Oh, okay. Rufus says, Lord, don't put it in something. And I look at, like, what's it? I got, like, a, a sack, anything we can, like, put it in and tie it up. Uh, I have lots of different little sack. pouches yeah. in my... Uh, we can put it in the barrel. Yeah, barrel. Put it in my barrel. Right, right. there. Drop there it in. Go. There we go. It's done. He lids it. If, if, we, if we start hearing a drum, then we run. That's right. If it starts to, I'll know. That's the rule. <laughs> so, my friends, I have good news and I have bad news. Okay. Apparently, uh, we have uh, taken care of business for these people who wanted to kill uh, all of us and Sergeant Tasker. The bad news is they are all members of the law enforcement locally here. We need to head upstairs oh. now. Oh. <laughs> well, wait, wait. Why did they just start attacking us as soon as we got into the door? They said that we were the ones that were looking for us. They just started attacking us. Upstairs. Wait. Why did they leave you alive? I'm sorry? Why did they leave you alive? Yeah, good question. That is a good story. Let us head up. <laughs> Alright. Yeah, okay. So you uh, you guys head back up to the tavern. At this point, we're going to head into our first tomb insight of the day. So uh, stay tight, players. We'll get to the next moment here in a few seconds' time. Alrighty. Let me, let me just mute these guys real quick here. There we go. Beautiful. Alright, so we are over here, my friends, on the two minutes section of Learn by Play. Of course, we've got part actual play, part DM advice, and uh, homebrew world creation. So we're going to talk about our first thing of the day, factions reinventing the Zentrum to fit our world. That's what we're doing today. And we've come over to my uh, my next screen over here, where I've created a, uh, a presentation, a slideshow. Oh my god, this feels like I'm back in school again. Uh, so, factions in D&D, reinventing the realms, boom. Uh, right. So, oh, I've got my pointer here on the screen so you can read with me. Uh, so, creating factions that interact with one another during the course of the campaign. This is something that I think is actually really interesting and, and really important thing about factions as well, to make the world feel alive. They're not just static factions that are doing nothing, um, but they are interacting with one another. The Zentering in this campaign are interacting with the Guard Force of Neverwinter. Uh, they are um, actively pushing their own agendas. And that's something which I think is important with creating factions. It's, it's something that a game named... Um, 
Stars of Unnumbered does really well. It has its own faction turn, and this is something that I really enjoyed about that game, is that you take your own turn uh, as a GM to see what the factions are doing in the world. What uh, In that game, is a uh, sci-fi world game, so, you know, they're taking over... Uh, different worlds, they're taking over colonizing places and stuff like that. And that's something that I think is kind of interesting to think throughout the course of your campaign, what are this what are the factions doing at this time? What are the in this case, the Zentrum up to at this time? What agenda are they trying to push and push and how far are they doing that? Uh, so something that I like to do as I go along in my notes is just to um, you know, if it's been a week or so in a campaign, to think about what different factions in the world might be up to as we go along. Uh, try and think about what factions might exist in places and cities that I have created. Um, this is a normal way that I go about this. Uh, we're going to talk later on about a different way about creating factions and creating locations about it. Um, but basically, if I've created a place, I've created a city, there's something that I often do first, is I like to create like a home hub city. Uh, I think about what factions might exist in that, so if I know that this city is particularly wealthy, then I think about what factions might be involved in that because of that wealth. Or if it's particularly uh, poor, what factions might exist in a place like that, are there more, you know, is there more of a black market? Um, in this example, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna use the template of these interim and see how we're gonna change them to fit our own worlds. Uh, so I can actually show you guys what I'm talking about rather than just talking about it. So, uh... This is what we know about the Zentrim at the moment. This is what is, if you go onto the Wizard of the Coast website, this is what you'll find about the belief system of the Zentrim. The Shadowy Criminal Organization active along the Sword Coast. Uh, their beliefs, the Zentrim is your family. You watch out for it and it watches out for you. You are the master of your own destiny. Never be less than what you deserve to be. And finally, everything and everyone has a price. So, um... That's what we know about them already. That's the kind of basic information that we know about the Zentrum. And we're going to go and change them and see what we want to do. So in our version of the realms, uh, because we had the Death Curse happen, we had uh, Tomb of Annihilation uh, and all that came with that, Asurarek's defeat uh, and the uh, uh, destruction of the Soulmonger. Uh, we're going back over to what happened on the, the kind of mainland and seeing what happened uh, over there on the Sword Coast. Now, during this time, there's been a great deal of wars, there's been undead, uh, have been rising greatly because of the death curse, uh, and a bunch of necromancers have been taking uh, advantage of that. The Zentrum have grown greatly in power since that death curse came. Why is this? Uh, they've monopolized on this period of war, and during this wartime, people have had nowhere else to turn. Uh, you kind of have to deal with people who, you know, everything has a price, and everything particularly has a price during wartime, right? So. Uh, this is what people have had to realize, they've had to face the fact that we need to help, uh, we need help, we need to call upon the Zentrum, and they have used that period, uh, during which the black market was rife as well. So, Shadow Wheel organizations tend to do particularly well during periods of war when homeland forces are looking outwards rather than inwards. So, um, that's what we're going to do in Lent. Therefore, they have an even greater network of spies and mercenaries available, stretching across the seas to Port Nye and Zari, which we actually saw in the first episode because uh, She Speaks With Tongues uh, was, I think, the, one of the first NPCs that we came across, actually. Uh, and she interacted with um, Nigelibu, of course, uh, over in Port Nye and Zari. So we're showing that not only are they active in Neverwinter, but they're also active over in Port Nye and Zari. We're showing the power of our faction within the first couple of episodes of the show. Their family... Uh, has grown to a point where there's a great deal of infighting between the Zentrum. It's fractured into two families, the Red Shades and the Mad Arrows. I wanted to do a kind of, uh, uh, um, Romeo and Juliet style family feud. Uh, and of course, because the Zentrum to me seemed like such a, like a mafia family, it's like a mob story, uh, with the Zentrum. Uh, they have fractured. Um, into two groups, it's Red Shades and the Mad Arrows, uh, and we'll see what it is here in a moment. I thought it'd be fun to add in a little tension between the families, a little bit of infighting, because they are a mob, uh, you know, they are a mob gang, basically. And if they've expanded in power, then it makes sense that they have, you know, their own empires expanded, then they're beginning to see fractures of their empire, where normally they're a smaller, shadowy cabal of people, they have now expanded, and they're having a couple of problems because of that. Uh, what did I say? Creating location. This is actually our next one. I'll stay on this uh, one to talk a little bit more. Uh, we have... Uh, I did forget I had it in. There we go. Yes. Um, the most powerful ally. Um, most powerful family, rather. The Red Shades. They have been trading with uh, Asarax hordes of undead uh, in the Sword Coast, basically. To the point where some of their members um, uh, are dabbling in necromancy. And, and that is why we've seen, in, in just a moment ago here, the strange, you know, uh, Harry Potter, 
uh, Death Curse tattoo on their arms because they've actually been trading uh, with some of our other villains that we're going to meet later in the campaign. Um, and we've kind of set up as villains, we haven't explored them very much yet. Um, so they've been dealing with these guys. Um, and that is basically why they have fallen out with this other family, the Mad Arrows, uh, who seek to end this bitter civil war between us entering by removing key leaders that have been touched by the taint of undeath. Uh, and these guys, the Mad Arrows, are basically willing to ally themselves with anyone willing to help. So something I like to do with factions, and particularly like villainous factions, is to cast them in shades of grey. Often what I see, uh, in the Zentra in particular, being this kind of, um, you know, gang, gangster family, uh, they're neither good nor bad, necessarily. We have the obvious bad guys who are the red shades, you know, these guys who are dealing with the undead and part of the overall problem of our campaign, but we also have the Mad Arrows over there who are also with the Zentrum, not going to be trusted by the party, but a possible option for the party to deal with them. Um, something that I think is important, particularly with villainous factions, is to think how will the party interact with them? How will the party engage with them? How do we make this feel like a living world? People, you know, we do have some evil people, but they have been willing to trade uh, and, and deal with Miguel previously in our campaign, and the Mad Arrows as well. Whilst the uh, party are going to think all these interim have this horrible evil curse tattoo thing, at least the Mad Arrows, uh, prevent, uh, present an option for us uh, as DMs to allow them to interact with the faction more than just killing them because sometimes in campaigns when you have villains and you know villainous groups of people all that the party ever do all the party ever see of them is killing them uh the only time they ever interact is when you're killing the bad cult you know the only time we ever see what the orcs are up to is when we're killing them or what the undead are up to is when we're killing them uh we presented ourselves an option here for the party to learn more about our faction uh which i think is Part of the, the reason that we write interesting things, right, is so that the players will see them, so that the players will have uh, take an interest in them. So um, that's a couple of bits on uh, the Zentrum that we've done. We're going to move on later on today and, and talk about creating locations for factions, uh, which is the other way of doing it, basically, which is creating a faction and then creating a location for them. So, um, yeah. We're going to move on to our next bit of play here because I really want to get to this next bit. It's going to be exciting. We're going to learn a lot about this uh, story that we're on. So um, we're going to cut back to our players here and see what they are up to. All right, everybody, we're back over here uh, with our players. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling? Ready or Just went to go get coffee. <laughs> yeah, pretty caffeinated. <laughs> it's okay. There we go. So you guys are entering into the tavern, uh, and you're heading upstairs to the room with Sergeant Tasker, I believe. Yes. Fantastic. So you... Um, you head up into the room, you see Sergeant Tasker, he's still lying on the floor, he's like propped himself up against the side. Uh, uh, Sergeant Tasker once again, guard uniform, portly fellow, um, somewhat, uh, yeah, probably in his like 40s, mid 40s or so, uh, and he definitely has quite a paunch to him. He is armed uh, with a uh, sword on his hip, but uh, he does not look fit to really get up, despite the fact that his material wounds have been healed, he still has just come back from the brink of death. Yep. Oh, my friend. <laughs> Um, I have good news and I have bad news. You're, we don't need to worry about your friends, uh, the tabaxi, causing any more harm, but we, the bad news is we have four dead tabaxi in the back alley. And I believe you said they were members of your patrol in training. I do not know what we can, or what you can do to explain this, other than there was a strange tattoo that was, um, I kind of looked to the others, housing? An even yeah, stranger but... creature mm. inside of it. We can show it to you if you are up to it. Uh, he he kind of nods faintly. Yes, yes, I, I would see this thing, if it is what I think it is. Um... Okay. Rufus reaches deep into his pack and pulls this, like, you know, <laughs> what, you said it was like 12 inches or whatever? 12 to 15 inch kind of, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. It's like a, it's like a, like, it feels like a spinal cord, right? It's like got little sections to it and little bumps to it. Um, and a little kind of almost rodent like skull on the, the top of it. Uh, it's like covered in blood, uh, cause it's been like ripped out from his, uh, arm basically. And Tasker kind of nods. Yes, yes, that's 
That looks like one of those things. You found this on the body. In oh. body. In all four of them, under a tattoo on their arm. Right. Yes, well, uh, you see, this has been part of what I've been investigating the past few months or so. That was I, what I was hoping, hoping that Circus Master Felius would be able to help me with. He said he had information on the matter. These tabaxi, it seems, are part of a group known as Lazenterim, who are a organization at first. We thought they were just standard criminals and thugs, but it seems that some of them have been working with the necromancers and creatures of undeath that have stalked our lands of late. It seems that they are willing to trade with almost anyone. They, uh, they gain power from that brand, that thing inside them. I'm not sure what it does, but it can't be good. It's clearly foul magic. And if they're as well connected as they seem that they are, inside our own guard force in Neverwinter, then, well, I fear, I fear for Neverwinter. Uh, Will, does this room have a uh, an alley view to it? Yeah. Um, can I look down? You got you got, and... a, you got a room with the alley view. You paid extra. Good, yeah. good. Um, I want to look down and watch the bodies. Because if this is necromantic right, magic, yeah, creep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I just want to look at some dead bodies. Well. Roll twenty. Yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, they don't appear to be moving. I mean, you, you like see the barrels that you stuff them in. They don't uh, appear to have moved. Um, but yeah. So he's just gonna stay there and keep an eye out. Okay. If I was to tell you that the ringmaster has taken a vacation and it's not available anymore. How would we go about finding out more information about these slithery buggers? What, what do you mean, not available anymore? Has he skipped town? Yes. Probably a deception check, Rufus. <laughs> He's speaking to an investigator. <laughs> Although he is. <laughs> <laughs> he says yes, but his head says no. Yeah. He can't stop it from shaking. <laughs> It's like you put away the bloody arrow, like you kind of take it out, look at it. Yes. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Erin um, was like elbowing him, and she's like, "This, I'm sorry. Contract. It's a contract. What did, I'm sorry, I'm what sorry. did you do with him? What what happened um, to him?" So Sergeant Tasker tries to kind of get to stumble to his feet. You know, he like pops oh, I himself help up. him up. Can I help him up? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Rufus reaches to help him on his feet. Yeah. He's like, do you want to punch me in the face? Just give me your fist. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, what what, what it... happened to, to Felius? He... We're in it to our necks, ladies. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, friends. Oh, I am technically a little dainty. Um, just my <laughs> size. Um... Sorry. <laughs> um, my friends, we are in this to our necks. This man might be our only hope going forward. You should tell him the truth. Oh, wait. So what happened was he ran into the wrong end of her arrow, and... There was this very tall, pretty, blonde man, he needed, and he came in and he, and he told me to see if we, if, if he would accidentally run into the wrong end of my, of my arrow. He came right. in and it was some man told you to kill Felius. Well, he just... made us sign a contract. And he said that if we did it, that he was going to have to kill us. And he said that he would take our heads and he would put them on his mantle and he would kill all the other people in the circus. And he said that if we did that, then he wouldn't kill us. But he wasn't sure if we were going to live in it. What was the thing that we could do? Because he had to he was going to kill us. <laughs> Rufus, like, Rufus like grabs her and tucks her and like pets her. So what? What she's trying to say, I think, is that. He told us we didn't really have a choice, and we was kind of in an abusive situation. Can I uh, see this contract? No, because <laughs> we didn't get a copy of it. We let him... Right. 
So Keep it. what you're telling me is a man came to you, made you sign a contract to murder a man. You did so, murdered the man, and didn't get a copy of this contract, and never saw this man again. Do you even know his name? Um, no, but he's sitting next to this pretty man right here, Miguel. He's sitting next to you in the show. I was wondering, you said a attractive looking gentleman. I was wondering if it might be the one who was in the front row with me. Uh, so that was him indeed. It was. Right. Interesting. I see. So someone wanted Phileas dead before I could get to him, it seems, and you have made that happen. He said it was something about um, Thelius had had lost him a lot of money, and and there was no way he was he could pay it back. So the way he was going to pay it back was getting his head and putting it on his mantle. But then we offered him the head. We said that we'd go get it, and he said he didn't want it. Consider yourselves indebted to the guard force of Neverwinter for what you've done. I am willing to overlook some of what you've done after you have saved my life here several times, but. You have killed an innocent man who is important in my investigation. So, if by innocent you mean he didn't do nothing to you, then yes. But um, I've got, I don't know, years worth of scars as does Shade Show, and he wasn't a very nice man. And did he make you sign a contract? No, but he whipped me. Like a beast. It is not a crime punishable by death. It is when he does it for years, and he was, he was, he was just told he was a bad man. What were we supposed to do? They offered us gold. Look, I've got plenty. And he like pulls it and like reaches way under his tunic. They offered us <laughs> gold and everything. So if I go, just rubs his bro for just oh. No. Are you a hired killer now? Then you, I point a man. Bad. I it say was, he's bad. Was, so you say it that when you say it that way, it sounds really bad. But we did, we really didn't mean it that way. You see, like he. We, 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 we were just very You're scared. You're no better we were, than the Zentarim, it would seem. We were scared of both sides. Sergeant Tasker. It's okay, Farin. We, he's right. We did a bad thing. You've already killed me once, it's... Miguel. No, you didn't. <laughs> Old man, what do you want? Well. You want something. You want to survive. Sergeant. You're surviving. What do you want from us? You're indebted to you. I think I... the debt's even. I Terrible men once are alive. I want to save our city, my friend, against but, these Zentarim creatures and those that they work for. I want to protect those that we can. We can't just let them go unrivaled. Can't let them just be in our guard force and murder who they want willy nilly. No. Well, then let's be on the same side. None of these threats. I agree. I think you're right. Rufus like stands up tall. He says, we didn't have to kill him, but we did. And it was wrong. And we clearly learned a lesson. So if we join your side, you're telling me that we'll be killing the right people for the right reasons. I suppose you could see it that way. Yes, you're on the side of the light in this case. Is that right? And it'll save a whole lots of people's lives. It could do, yes, if we if we work together and do this properly, then I think so. It seems like our best lead is that that man that you saw. The blonde one. No, I must ask, before you get involved in this, why are you traveling all together? What, what are you else involved in? Oh. My name's on a list. Yeah, we don't really know. We, the, the blonde man came to us and he told us that we need to kill uh, Thelius and we were like, no. And he was like, well, we're going to kill you. And we were like, oh, fine. And so we, we did that. And see, the thing is, I, I've kind of grown up in the circus and, and Rufus, we found him on the road at one point and he doesn't remember anything. Rufus has no idea where he came from. And so um, I put just, my finger on Farron's lips and I smile at him. And she goes, oh. <laughs> Um, I believe that our purposes may be the same, my friend. You see, all the way back in Chult, the Zintherum tried to get in touch with me to see what my business was here in Neverwinter and tried to recruit me to be one of theirs. They currently believe that I am, hence 
the deception that I pulled that saved your life. I believe that we can work together. We were brought together, the four of us, to come and see all of these different forces that seem to be at work within Neverwinter and to sort out, I guess, the good from the bad, as you said. Well, it's a uh, pretty bleak picture in Neverwinter right now. My guard forces have been limited greatly by the wardens who have come to power in the city. Whilst they may be a good force in that they keep the city safe against undead, this band of paladins, I, I do not trust them well whatsoever. I know that in a few days' time they plan to shut down the College of Mages within Neverwinter, and, well, that sits... does not sit well with me whatsoever. This blonde man, I don't... can't really go just on that, but... but perhaps we could find more. Perhaps the mages might know. They are well connected. Yes, they... they are perhaps even more well connected than you know. I was not sure where your loyalties lied with these wardens and what do you know of this Marcus Pontimus? He is a holy leader now. He defeated a great horde of the undead single-handedly, if word can be believed. He is rarely seen out in public, but when he does, there are crowds of adoring fans throwing flowers and celebrations in his wake. He is seen as the holy protector of Neverwinter, and with Lord Neverember having not been seen for months now, retreated into his tower, he is the only ruling body over the city of Neverwinter. You see, Neverember, he funds uh, my guard force, partly why I've had to reduce so many numbers and bring in cheap labor. And he looks out the window at the dead tabaxi in the street. It's because Neverember has gone missing. No, none can enter into his tower. None may see him. I'm not sure what's going on, but with him gone and Marcus Pontimus and the wardens in charge and the centurim infiltrating my ranks, then my friends, Neverwinter is it's not a safe place to be right now. Yes, and uh, as you say, apparently the least safe for the mages who might be the greatest force to assist us moving forward. Would Pontimus, would he benefit from your death? My death, well, I suppose he might, yes. In so far mm. as the guard force would not have any leader anymore, they, well, there's only a few of us really left, any veterans who could lead the force. What about the man in the carnival? Would he benefit from his death? Belius, why I don't see any connection between the Zentarim and the Wardens. None that I've seen so far, at least. All right. You said that uh, that the ringleader had um, information. He knew about the little critters? I don't know exactly what he knew. Rufus, because he's dead. I just heard that he had a tip-off for me, one which would be very important. Oh. That this blonde man that you've spoken of, did he know, Felius? I mean, he told us that he owed him a great debt, so I assumed he knew him pretty well. Then most likely, Circus Master Felius was going to tell me about this gentleman who may be behind the Zentarim, perhaps a leader of theirs. Certainly, he does not seem like a fair man if he's sending out murder contracts. That's true. Alas, we um, won't know, it seems. So, we're supposed to go to Neverwinter, but you're here telling us it's not a very nice place to be right now. Well, um, does it seem like a nice place to be right now, Eva? Um, is there a, uh, are we there to like, see it's somebody? Horrible. How do we get you the information you need so we can make up for this little um, mishap? Well, I that think, the ringleader had. I think the best source of information would be at the College of Mages. I think getting inside there and speaking with the mages there would be the best idea. 
That requires us traveling back to Neverwinter, of course. We need a safe place to stay. Somewhere that we can hide away. I don't trust any of my guard bunkhouses or uh, anywhere that the guard might be because we don't know who might be watching. Do you, having experienced with these, these critters, as my friend here has described them, do you have any knowledge if they have some sort of bond between them that that the Zentherum might know what has occurred here this evening. I've never seen one of those things in the flesh. I've just seen a few tattoos that put me on to their case, but uh, I don't know. Perhaps they can see through them. Perhaps they just know where they are. Perhaps it's just a mark of allegiance and loyalty. An initiation, perhaps. Oh, something like that. I know a little bit about serpents. And I would hazard a guess that it is more than just a entry right. As you say, perhaps it has given them power. However, I, I believe we know a place well off the map that we could at least go for the evening. Really? We also have some horses to return. Perhaps we should leave now, especially if the death of these creatures has somehow alerted the Zetherim that something has gone amiss here. Not to mention, he looks out the window, the circus is on fire. Ah, uh, yes, that is true. Ah, uh, yes, let us be away from here as soon as possible. If you have the horses and I can uh, walk again, and he kind of gets up, you know, he's trying to walk. He's going to need, he probably leans on Rufus who helped him up. Uh, to to walk, uh, I can make it. I think. Take me to this place. Yeah, let's take him back to Mutz. Lead the way. All right. Good question: um, Is that have we during that conversation was it long enough to consider a short rest? Yeah, you can take a short rest. Uh, War Fifteen locks. minutes. <laughs> nice. We like that. Very Do nice. we have four horses or five horses? Uh, you have four horses we have three pony. horses and a pony. Three horses and a pony, yeah. Three horses and a Shetland <laughs> pony. Okay. Um. It's a, it's a very strong pony, I hear, though. <sighs> Maybe not that strong. I see right. His face. Rufus looks at it, and he stands taller than its, like, back. <laughs> like, there's no way. Um, he says, well, oh, why don't I... Um... I'll just strap some things to him, walk next to him. It's fine. I love this little boy. He's so cute. Did, did the tabaxi have horses? No. Oh. No. <laughs> this is, um, uh, do we, did you name your horses? You always name your animals. Miguel, you didn't name the horses. Am I gonna have to name them all? Yes, why don't you do that for us <laughs> as we go on our way? Um, I am attempting to figure out uh, the best distribution of weight so that we are able to ride through the night as we uh, need to make haste. Via a complex series of levers and pulleys, uh, you can... <laughs> you can... Yes, we, all, if we figure out who's riding with who. I was just going to say, if you really want to make a deal of this. Of... It's the uh, it's the, the stilts uh, and the, uh, the bottle bees stilts back <laughs> from season one. Uh, no. Yeah, amazing. So um, we're gonna skip over the travel because it's gonna take you long to get back. Uh, Miguel head out, for, uh, Miguel and Zephyr head out from the city pretty quickly, and it's not long until you return there. But by the time you do, it is nightfall as you return to the city of Neverwinter through its open, shining gates, protected by a great deal of the wardens. You see these paladins that are around, uh, who are um, you know some of them are like wearing this you know full like heavy metal paladin armor that are on. You know they look like characters out of Warcraft. Uh, others of them are more simple like street corner kind of priests and clerics who look to be ordained by the wardens. So on most street corners uh, you will see representation of this new faction, especially if you were to go to the temple district where you see that all of the temples have been uh, unified basically um, under, you know, they all carry one banner as well. Uh, they still carry the individual banners of their own gods, you know, you see the Bahamut Lefanders and around of course, but they also bear the uh, same banner of the Wardens to show the unity uh, that the Wardens have brought to um, the religion and to the city of Neverwinter itself. Um, 
because we are technically sort of at wartime, there is a almost high alert going on at all times. It seems like there's a great deal of uh, forces around who are ready to jump to defend the walls of Neverwinter. And as you return, you see the damage which has been done by the uh, former sieges against the city itself. You can see where parts of the wall have crumbled away and been destroyed and are only now being repaired by masons who are going uh, and, you know, throwing up these huge rocks up there to try and repair the walls. Um, there's a great deal of... Um, you know, uh, these warden forces around who seem to be ready to jump into action. So, uh, you return to Mutt's place, right? Uh, you walk in through the door, uh, and you see the sign, uh, which, of course, is, uh, you know, where, uh, Mutt has uh, hastily uh, scribbled over his last sign and placed up a new one after uh, the conversation he had earlier today. Uh, and it is... Uh, we allows all peoples in here and we does not discriminate. And all of that discriminates is three different words. Dis. Crim. Innate. Matt, but you have made a new sign. It is glorious. Yes, you see Matt as he comes in, the uh, big burly kind of half orc with uh, just love in his eyes. Uh, and he turns, oh, hello. Uh, it's Miguel, isn't it? And, uh, oh, we've got new friends, new friends as well as my friend's effort. What I appreciate and respect as a person of Genasi. Uh, we've got, Thanks, we've got another, we've got a little elf here uh, who's real small. Uh, and we got, hello. hello, and we got, oh, we got a bread and butter, we got our human. How, how you doing? Pleased to meet you. Mutt is my name. Rufus meets him with a, a giant hand. Yeah, he, he, he offers an equally giant hand back. <laughs> I like him. Where'd you find him? Have you? Isn't How are he you? glorious? He's just he is a wonderful, wonderful friend. And he stocks wonderful uh, alcoholic beverages. I know, oh, I, I, could, see that. I know I could use a drink after the evening. <sighs> Absolutely. As part of my inclusion policy, everyone is allowed to drink alcohol in here. And everyone is allowed to sit down here. And everyone is allowed to talk about what makes them special. Either <laughs> in a classical sense or a racial sense or a uh, theatrical sense. So, uh, yeah, make yourselves at home. Do you want rooms? They have to be very nice, my friend. Yeah. We Can have I, also yes, a big bed. This is back in the, in the stable, as you call it. Oh, yes, that's my, I call that my stable. He looks to Rufus and, and Ferran, who is a man. I call that out there my stable because it never moves anywhere. It's always, it's always where I, where I put it. Uh, I always wonder why they called it that. Right. Well, uh, so I can show you the room. You want small rooms or big rooms? Do you want uh, large rooms? Do you, would you, what kind of rooms? Uh, Zephyr pulls out a couple of gold that belong to the tabaxi, and he says, give us your best rooms, mate. It's on the puss pusses. Uh, oh. oh, I've got a few of those here, what I include. He kind of points over to the corner, and there's a, uh, looks like a merchant, uh, this tabaxi who's kind of, covered in all his shawls, uh, and he looks like he's probably from uh, Cholt, in fact, Miguel. He's got that air about him, and he wears the same okay. kind of uh, garb uh, about him. He's got all these kind of uh, wares out on the table. Um, and uh, and Mutt says, we include him as well. So, um, I'll, I'll show you what. Now, you, he looks at Zephyr, are an air Ganassi, so what I've done is I have, and he shows you into the room, I've left the window open, uh, and I've nailed the window open. So, uh, you can always feel the air on your skin. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. You are welcome. He, show, That's so nice. He, uh, he opens up uh, another door and shows into Ferran. This is your room, and because you is an elf, I have made your bed smaller because you need less sleep. Well, uh, that's... True, uh, thank you. Yep. Smaller beds, smaller sleeps, what I always say. Uh, he, My uh, father used to say that. Did he now? Wait. <laughs> he looks at you for a second. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, I have only a half 
I felt. <laughs> he, he looks over to uh, to Rufus. Uh, this is your room. Uh, o- opens it up, uh, and I have made your room as bland as possible because you is a human. And, right. um, and, and you're pretty standard as they come. <laughs> Unless you got some kind of variant about you, but I don't know that about you because I haven't asked that about you. So this is the most normal room I could find. This is, per- is, is perfect, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, would a bed hold me? Is it super strong? I. It's not a mimic, if you're asking that. It's not going to grab you. <laughs> no, I'm afraid I'm going to smash it. I need some extra reinforcement unless you give me at least two beds. You want... Okay, I will bring in two beds. And <laughs> I'll, like, I'll bring it. I'll, t- I'll carry it for you. Don't, I don't want you to go out of your way. You've been so kind. Um, just, uh, I don't want to smash your bed it is, it is going to mean that one of you isn't going to have a bed. Well, what if we just put the mattress on the floor? Perfect. And That's even have... more normal. There you go. I can remove... Rufus pulls it to the floor. <laughs> Beautiful, um, yeah, and uh, and then and then Miguel, uh, this is your room, uh, and he opens it up and it's just a room full of mirrors. Uh, I put a lot of mirrors in here so what you can look at yourself in the mirror, uh, because that is something that I see you doing a lot. Mutt, my friend, it is like you read my mind. You could not have done something more wonderful to make me feel more at home in your lovely establishment. You, my friend, are an enlightened, enlightened man. What can I say? What can I say? Person, because I accept you two for exactly who you are. Thank you very much. Well, uh, that is the spirit of this place. If there's anything I can help you with, then I do have an assortment, or I've got flashcards, which are local rumors, local factions, and possible side quests that I've made just in case any adventurers come by and I, I put them on flashcards because I forget them otherwise. So you could just come downstairs by the bar if you want. I've got a wine list down there as well. We will freshen up and we will join you down at the bar momentarily, my friend. All right. I take this big, deep, glorious bow he to beam, our friend. He beams to himself and, and yeah. heads downstairs. Rufus, this is going to be the first time in, like... Our whole lives that we're not sharing a room. I know. I don't have to worry about nobody coming and beating me in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> He's so genuine. Um, that was so earnest. <laughs> I mean, and and this time, I'm not going to have to hide have to behind you. I'm for someone to come beat me in the middle of the night. <laughs> you say that now, but they usually don't come as pretty ladies. To beat you, I mean, in the middle of the I've night. Never said that it had to be a lady. Rufus looks around. Um, is anybody else hot? I'm feeling a little hot. I'm sweating yeah. again. Excuse yeah, me. No, it's not. Sergeant Tasker is like, I, I think I'll retire to my room now. Uh, and his room has gotten like, uh, he's got uh, like a conspiracy board up. Uh, oh, with the wall. Because, the yeah, because because he's a classic investigator. Uh, and he mumbles something about the case that makes you or the case that breaks you as he heads into his room. Uh, you know, he's got like black coffee on the table, that kind of thing. So uh, <laughs> he heads to retire. He needs to sleep. Uh, but it's, it's night time, so you know, you know. Shall we have a drink and then call it a night? I'm oh, sure yeah. we all need some rest. You uh, took a grievous wound, my friend. My, my incredibly large friend. Uh, <laughs> He's just, true, I guess he's what the bigger they are, they are, the harder they fall. This is a true statement. I'll tell you, it was the fall that got me. It wasn't that dagger. That, that yeah. kitty, he had nothing on me. Of course. It was that fall. I just put my arm around and was like, we have such adventures we are going to have and drinks we are going to drink <laughs> as we march through this life of adventure together. <laughs> my tiny, tiny friend. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Rufus puts another arm around you and it's so big. It's like your head's <laughs> in his armpit. Yeah, and he's <laughs> squeezing you. I just love him. He's just so cute. Uh, and he takes you down and says, you know what you need? You need a drink. I need a drink. You need a drink. 
I do need a drink. Let's get straight. Always, my friend. I kind of see that she has picked me up and that I'm almost like this rag doll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my feet are off the ground as uh, as he as Tiny is taking me down the stairs to the bar. I, so the rumor has it that you uh you know how to drink uh, you have to drink with the best of them, my friend. Um yeah, it's um it's not yeah. I drink a lot. <laughs> Tea, I drink well, You are a, drink you a, are a large lot. man. Probably takes a lot. <laughs> it um it does. Oh, uh, speaking of drinks, drinks. <laughs> like beats on the table. Yeah, um, but, can we get some drinks? Yes, absolutely. I've got an assortment of wines on my wine. You see that actually uh, at this point Mutt has got little spectacles on so that he can he can read properly, kind of puts on little spectacles. So we got an assortment of wines, um some of the finest wines. We've also got Miguelibu, uh different rums. Uh, and we also have a selection of fine oils for beans. No knives. Rufus, what is it that we would drink when we were in the circus? We, we drink a lot. I've got cooking, I've got <laughs> cooking oil, I've got vegetable oil, I've got uh, rubbing oil, uh, you know, for fires have, and stuff like that. Um, rubbing alcohol, I think that's what we drink. Well, I do have alcohol, and you can definitely rub that. <laughs> Rufus contemplates that and he says, "Yeah, I'll take some of that." Me too. Take some alcohol, yeah. All right. I'll take, take yeah. you. You read up the whole list. He's like, "I'll just the beer." I'll well, take the, one the, alcohol, the, please, sir. One <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> so, my friend Mutt, I know you are a man of new experience. May I join you behind the bar for just a moment to see if I can show you something that I learned back in my home of Mazdeca? I don't see why not. I like to include everyone, including in my personal space. I come around the bar, and uh, I see you have the oils here. I assume you have some spices around as well, yes? I do, I do indeed. I have. He brings, he like, he like flicks a compartment and a spice rack jumps out. <laughs> this is, now this, this is convenient. Now is it, now my friend Zephyr, I know that we, we are not always see eye to eye on things. However, I, I have something I want you to try. You'll see, you are not the first pirate that I have met in all of my travels around this place. I had this wonderful pirate who did this amazing thing with rum and spices. Morgan was his name, but I never liked his, uh, all of his uh, way that he tried to sell his product. But uh, he mixes up some rum and spices up and he goes, perhaps we can maybe get something new for all of us. I present to you a Captain Zephyr's. Zephyr Spice. takes it, looks at it, raises one leg up onto a bar stool, and well, thanks a lot, Captain Zephyr. Never thought I'd hear the day. Cheers. Cheers. I get my Miguel Abu. Nice. And drink away, I'm sure. Yeah. Look. Yes. Look. Uh, the uh, Tabaxi, uh, who's uh, sitting in the corner with all of his uh, items and trinkets, uh, will look over to you at one point in the night and say, Why, you all look like you could use some help. Oh, a few wounds on your skin. Oh, so fleshy and, and weak. Perhaps you could do with some of my special wares. Um. What do you have to offer, my friend? <laughs> Uh, he uh, kind of like sprints his arms out in a pretty um, a ridiculous gesture at the uh, the trinkets that he has on his table. I have many things, potions, little trinkets, magical items, or a sticky pointy sword. Ah. My name is He Sells Things. Ooh. <laughs> Once again, please. I'm sorry. My you name, sell things. He sells yes, things. That is a translation from my home tongue. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. It's a beautiful oh. name. Yes. It's hometown of Walmart. <laughs> oh. Yes. Not far from. Nope. I go to Walmart is a cousin of mine. <laughs> uh, Will, can we see his forearm? Uh, sure. Uh, he's actually covered in shawls, so you can't see like the skin on his forearm. Okay. Uh, yeah, Farron will like be like, I like she she like sort of catches Zephyr's eye and she like looks at the Tabaxi's hand. It's like I love the rings that you're wearing oh, and, and, yes. the, and the and like may I see? 
Yes, do not mistake me for my cousin. He sells rings, but... Yeah, the, oh, of course. But this, uh, the, I do have the, some. The bracelets and everything? And she oh. sort of starts to move his uh, his uh, sleeve up. And mm. so she's like, oh, these are just beautiful. Are they for sale as well? Well, some of them might be if you have coin. Um, we, we do have some. Uh, Zephyr, come look at these bracelets. Uh, you oh, can... I love you, you move it up his right arm. You don't see any tattoo uh, on his arm. Uh, it could be like further up all the way up his arm, or as far as you know, it could be on any location. But from, from the past, you've seen that it's been on their right kind of forearm, and uh, he doesn't have one on him. You're getting very touchy with my arm. But sorry, you're just, you're so fluffy, I couldn't stop touching. Well, I, it's been raining. I get all fluffy sometimes. It's the humidity. I have a wonderful conditioner that you can leave in for that. Yes, uh, <laughs> humidity of this place. It does not agree with him. Uh, so, uh, would you like anything? I have some potions you might want if you are a fighting type. I see those big swords that you have there. Perhaps you could do with some healing in the battles that you will undoubtedly be seeing against the hordes of undead outside. I do have, I've got, I got lots of gold. And he reaches under his fat roll and pulls out the second bag of gold that's been hiding. Oh. Says, we could buy some stuff. This is why we killed him. So we have money to do things. That is why you get money, yes. To do why? things. I've never to... had money. I've never really bought anything. Would you like to buy something, my big You best friend? believe it, Mr. Kitty Cat. Oh, oh, what's your name? He's a, he's a, he's this is fun. Yeah, Farron like pulls out her bag too, and she's like, "This sounds fun. What can we buy?" Well, Zephyr looks over at Miguel and says, "We're gonna die." You know. <laughs> uh, he's. I'm looking at Zephyr. And I'm like, "Wow." I thought I was a spectacle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rufus goes, "What? What do you want? You two gentlemen, I'll buy you anything you want." There is jewelry. I have. Uh magic items, little pointy swords, or anything you want. He sells things, has many, many things. <laughs> Farron is like still holding his hand, and she's like, oh, I just love this ring. And she's like looking at Miguel, and she's like, it's just such a nice ring. Here. Yeah. Rufus, this is right. oh. we'll buy you that ring. You want that ring? I'll buy it for you. Perhaps we should, knowing that we are Heading into unknown territory. Focus on the practical. You said no. something about potions of healing and yeah. your name being he sells trinkets, perhaps interesting trinkets that he sells keep things. us alive. Things. Things. He said things. I thought you said trinks. I'm oh, sorry. No. It it's is accent. my accent. Yes. It is my accent. He says we're going very French all of a sudden. Myself. No. no. Yeah, um, <laughs> no, 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 uh, so, <laughs> baby, so, uh, uh, healing potions, yes, I sell these at 75 gold pieces, a potion. Oh, that is quite, quite a steep price. What other items do you have that would go, perhaps, help I, to keep us I have alive? these, uh, bag in bucket healing potions that are a little bit old, out of date, if you will. They sell at 25 gold pieces a potion. They still work, just not quite as well. The bargain bucket. I'm not sure if I want to risk my life <laughs> on a bargain. I don't buy things out of buckets. Well, I only eat things out of buckets. <laughs> I only eat things out of buckets and carry one on my back, basically. But I don't want to eat, I don't, ah. I buy nothing from buckets. So, I, you, uh, tell me about these other trinkets and daggers that uh, you were pointing at. Oh, this dagger here, it is from far, far away. It is said that it comes from underneath the ocean itself, and that it was touched by a kraken. And it kind of like shows out this, this kind of blue dagger, and it kind of, it does like glint in a magical light. Uh, touched by a crack in itself, by a sea goddess as well, and it was brought to land by a sea nymph who uh, gave it as a gift to our pirate lover. It found its way into my hands 25 years ago, and I have held it safe for the right person ever since. The properties it holds are magnificent and dangerous. 
can only be wielded by someone who is fit who loves the sea. That twenty on the insight. Oh, he's, he's <laughs> totally like like you like look at it again, and you're like, is that blue powder? And you like he like you know like he's totally, he's certainly totally got a dagger and probably thrown something on it. it. It it glinted magically at first, but you're not so sure if this is real magic. No thanks. He sells things. Aye. It doesn't seem to have the, quite the the glint in the in the air that you theatrically presented to me. Fine, fine, then perhaps... It's a lovely story, though. The young lady would like this ring. And uh, the, the ring that Farron was uh, pointing to, it has more properties than just being a ring. I found it. No, it was gifted to me 74 years ago by a princess of the Sword Coast. All the way from Luskin, this jewel of the ocean, it comes. And it brings with it great fortune and luck. And it is said to be able to beguile and charm any man or woman whom the bearer wishes to charm. <laughs> Farron is like, slams her hands on the table and is like, how much? For this trinket here, this will set you back a hundred gold pieces. <laughs> yeah, at this point, Zephyr <laughs> looks at Farron and just says, He's not telling the truth. This is his livelihood. He sees us walk in. It's an act. Kind of like the, the circus. He says, it's, true. True. it's not lying. Uh, Rufus looks at me and says, are you, you, are you trying to trick us? Trick you, my dear friend. I do not believe that I could ever hope to trick someone like yourself. No, this ring is indeed said to hold great fortune. I do not claim that it truly does, but if you believe the rumors, you'll know. And there is power in rumors, my friend. As you well know, you are a smart man, I can tell. Well, I am kind of smart. Um, oh, you figured me out right away, didn't you? The group. You figured me out right away. I, this ring doesn't truly hold the magical powers, but I do believe it oh. holds good fortune, for I have never, I have never ever failed on a persuasion check, you know. I have always been able to persuade people to do what I want them to do. I believe uh, it holds Zephyr great fortune. Zephyr forward and pushes 10 gold pieces that were the tabaxis towards he sells things but keeps his finger on the top of the stack he sells things do you sell information as well oh now now we are talking my friend but this this does not seem like a good place to be chatting in an open tap room with such inclusivity no 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 we must narrow down this inclusivity to be a private conversation between the group of us and Mutt, Mutt, and Mutt is standing there like, I, I did include myself in this conversation, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and he still things kind of, like, he gets all his wares up and kind of throws it into a sack, tosses it over his shoulder. Let's go to your room, then. All right. So he heads up he should buy you a drink first. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to be licking up. Peacock. <laughs> he looks over at Miguel Peacock. Everyone's going to need to do this, but uh, you should be the one that talks. I've never seen you fail a persuasion check either. I was taking it as a challenge myself. Uh, yes, my friend. Let us go talk <laughs> what information you might have. Perhaps we can convince each other and persuade each other into things that we've never dared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so are we uh, all going up there? Yes, all oh. join us. Let's yeah. see what we have. <laughs> Please, let's all cram ourselves in a room together as Miguel flirts with a lot of us. Which, like, uh, which Baron, bench? like, slunks behind I... and she's, like, walking next to Rufus and it's like, I'm never going to oh, get Normally, I would do something like this one on the one. Uh, this evening, it seems it'd be best if we all stayed together. Uh, which let's room? do it in my room. Well, yeah, okay. Zephyr's room, yeah? My, my room's cooler. And he looks over at Rufus. You said you're always sweaty. This is true. I, I, I vote his room if it's got to breeze. 
it's got a breeze. It has been quite literally, the windows have quite literally been nailed uh, open by, uh, by <laughs> Muds. And he's really gone to town on it. You know, he's got like five nails in this thing. Like, you're not pricing this thing off unless you're like, you know, snapping out the base. So you walk in uh, and you have the uh, room of an alley view again. You can actually see onto the stables from here uh, right. and see your, see your horses and ponies that Rufus is naming. Uh, and he sells things comes in along with you. So, what information is it that you are looking for, my friends? Perhaps you are trying to find a, uh, a love uh, or a love child. Perhaps okay. we are trying to find something about someone else in imports and exports. What oh. do you know of the Zephyrum? Oh, oh, many, many of my cousins have entered into the Zentrum over the years. Back where I come from, in Port Nyanzaru, it is quite common. It is not good work for Tabaxi around there, you understand, so we fall into these things. Uh, yes, I know a little about them. What is it that you are looking to learn? What do you know about a group with a unique tattoo? One of a red skull that hides a secret beneath. Ah, oh, that is interesting, my friend. As he leads in conspiratorially. Now, the Zentrim used to be a small little group of us just in Port Nyanzaro recently. Over the past few years or so, we have expanded that operation into uh, the Sword Coast. Never winter alongside, you know. The family have gotten a lot bigger, and well, there are now two groups inside the center, and two families, if you will. One of them, I believe you might be interested in. And he extends his hand for coin. Zephyr puts in one gold piece. Clink. Ah, this group, known as the Red Shades, for the tattoo that they have is of a red shade, yes. Good name. And uh, they, well, they ally themselves with some very naughty people from outside. And he kind of Describe gestures. One he, of their bosses. he gestures to outside the city of Neverwinter theatrically. Oh, their bosses I have never seen, but I know that they work with those who control the dead. And for that, they pay a price. Now, I have another cousin who is in the Mad Arrow family, known because one of their leaders is known as Mad Arrow. He is a shot better than any archer in all of Faerun. He can strike a pair off a man's head from that's, 700 that's yards that's twice at the same time. Play. Yes. Well, he is a shot unlike any other, and Mad Arrow, he is crazy as well. Crazy, I tell you. But they, they have not allied themselves with the dead who walk on the streets outside, who are said to still be controlled by a shadow from Chult. Something that is dead but can never die. Eh? No, the Mad Arrows, they, they fight with the Red Shades. They are Zentarim still. They consider themselves true Zentarim. I know where to find them for a price. And he extends his hand again. Drops two gold pieces in. Ah, excellent, excellent. Well, I suppose I could show you. Mad Arrows, they are... Not to be trifled with, they are Zentarim still and still fiercely loyal, but there is civil war amongst their family. Red Shades killing Mad Arrows. But I think it is these Red Shades that you should fear the most, for the many of them have powers over death and undeath. A long, pretty, a long, a blonde-haired man with pretty skin and pretty face. Oh, and uh, he might describe the rest of him. Yeah, if you have information that's correct, describe the rest of him. Long blonde hair, a sword on his hip, leather armor often on him, very posh attitude, 
And he works in law. In law? Oh. Contracts. He, he gave the to contract. the contract. A long one, that's him. That's got to be. Indeed. You are, are dealing with the magistrate. Ah, uh, uh, oh. He is an interesting fellow. Yes. He, and he extends his hand again. Three. Oh, takes it again and pockets it. He makes law around the city of Neverwinter. Very important man and well connected to Lysenterin. Yes, yes. He, some whisper, may be one of the many leaders of the Red Shades. Well, I do not have one. Like most families, they have key members. Now, where you could find him, that is simple. You can find him at the College of Mages. I don't think we were going to go there. Ah, oh, that is good then, isn't it? Very good. In what? general, when someone can be paid for information, you don't like to give them information that they can sell to others. Not to sell. <gasps> oh. <laughs> so, you see, I haven't really talked to anybody else except for Rufus for uh, a long time. And I tell Rufus everything. So, <laughs> he sells things. Mm. What does your price to not sell things? Oh, to not sell this? Why? He counts the coins that he has in his hand, which is like probably over 20 gold at this point. Well, uh... Let's double this number here. Another 20, and I will keep my lips shut. And he, like, he gets his tail, and his tail forms the, you know, like the uh, finger over lip. Tell you what. Interesting thing my friend, Tiny, here told me about. It only took him, eh, but a moment to make a decision about whether or not someone's head was worth more to him than it was to that person. How about for 10 golds, you keep your head? Ooh, we're on an intimidation check. I would not like to be selling my head. It's a 17. Oh, yeah. Uh, he definitely he kind of like gulps a little bit. 10 more gold is reasonable. He sells things, cannot sell things without his head. Very true. You are a very smart man. And I will tell you, for this favor you are doing us, we will buy some more of your goods without the negotiation that you know should be occurring. Yes, yes, good idea. A couple more trinkets, perhaps. I'm thinking the potions. Oh, potions, potions. You want the big ones or the older, slightly out of date stale ones? 25 gold for the stale ones or 75 for the fresh, organic, homemade hailing potion? Oh. It's vegan. <laughs> you had me at organic. <laughs> what, if, what if we give you 100 gold, you keep your little key cat mouth shut? And then we also take two of your better ones. Or you also, and she's like, tries to mooch off of Miguel's intimidation. She's like, you also throw in the ring. The but pretty this, one. This yes, ring, for the lady. This ring is worth far more than that. No, no. I think for this, you will have to earn some more coin and come back to his sells things for the coin. But... The healing potions. Uh, if you buy one, I will give you one free of the smaller, older ones. Oh, oh free. Okay, we take one. Oh, uh, here. And he like hands him a hundred, you know, hundred gold pieces in like a sack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he says, "So you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> we yes, take these for free." <laughs> <laughs> Rufus, my friend, let me uh, take care of this transaction. Yeah, he's clearly no good at this. I give him the seventy-five yeah. gold. <laughs> <laughs> because you've just paid for both. Oh. I give him the 75 gold, uh, as he said, for the free one and get the the good one and the stale one. Yep. Who knows what that 
is. And um, I'm sure that's going to be... Uh, yeah. You can add one healing potion and one stale healing potion. Okay. <laughs> and... Um, uh, actually, we owe him 85 and the 10 gold to keep his mouth shut. Yep. All right. He uh, he says, pleasure doing business with you. I will be downstairs if you need me. I have a room here with Matt. Very inclusive. Yes, we, we, have, we, have, we have discovered that. He is quite, uh, quite the host. He, uh, he smiles and have a cat-like grin, uh, heads out from the room and closes the door with his tail. That was slick. The tail thing. It's pretty cool. I'm really bummed out about I'd that. like that to investigate just what all he can do with that tail. Oh. For God's sake. Haven't we had enough kitty cats today? Yes, we I, actually have. I'm tired. I'm so tired. I'm gonna go lay down on my mattress on the floor. I believe it is that time to, uh, to turn in for the night. All right. Oh, great. Everyone going to their respective bedrooms? Yeah. All right. I have I have a hundred mirrors to look at. <laughs> <laughs> I have a three sixty piece. Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> uh, yeah, you uh, you head in uh, full of nights, and uh, the next morning wake up. Uh, Mark comes and wakes you all up. Uh, he comes in uh, to um, Zephyr's room first. as the first one along. Uh, you know, rat -a tat tats on it. Excuse me, uh, Jeffy, it's Matt. Yeah, Matt. He comes to the door. He, uh, he opens it up and blows in your face. <sighs> I heard that's how you people like to start your morning. With some fresh air. Yeah, you, you heard wrong. But I can't say I didn't like it. So, it's maybe, nice. Maybe your people should start doing this, then. I'm adding to your culture. Next time I go to the meeting, I'll let them all know. Good luck, yes. And please, please, Jack, if you can get the minutes from that meeting, I would love to read. Hey, and he kind of leans in. If I can get you in, Mutt, you can come with me. <laughs> he beams again, thank you very much. Uh, and he goes on each of your doors and kind of, you know, knocks, knocks on it to wake you all up. I've got breakfast downstairs. And, uh, you know, as you head downstairs, you'll see Sergeant Tasker's kind of waking up as well. He's already down there. Uh, he's tucking into a breakfast of eggs and bacon and beer uh, that Mutt has made for him, uh, along with uh, a black coffee and a cigarette, uh, because Sergeant Tasker is, is, is pretty brooding, pretty brooding. Um, <laughs> so uh, he greets you on the way down. You also spot he sells things. who's in the corner. Uh, he is drinking milk. Uh, in the corner, a big flagon of milk, and he kind of waves over to you uh, with his tail as well uh, as you guys walk downstairs, and Sergeant Tasker says, Ah, good, good, come, come. Sit down. Uh, I've got breakfast for you all. Why, thank you very much. And I look to Mutt and sort of throw him a silver and make sure to keep him coming for our friend he sells trinkets. He is a most studious friend. <laughs> He's, yeah, uh, he goes and gets a... Oh, just go outside to the cow. Uh, and uh, Mutt returns a few minutes later with a bucket of milk. Um, and he just like sets that on the table for uh, he sells things. I give him a wave. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, Sergeant Tasker sits down to, to, to breaking his fast along with you. So, uh, we all ready for today? I'm going to have to go out into the city and, and see what I can find out about this blonde gentleman of ours. Yes, and uh, we learned um, information last night about the blonde gentleman. Oh, really? No. Please do do tell more. Uh, uh, He's the about, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he, the College of Majors. They said he might he might uh, be there. A magistrate. He's, he's part of the. He's a leader, uh, person of your uh, of your cat gang that you were talking about. What are they called? The red, red shades. That one. Uh, yes. Right. I'm well, that, that that is valuable information. So he, you said he's at the College of Mages. Strange well, that there'd be a lawmaker there. Well, they said he was a lawyer, right? That's somebody. Does he make laws? 
So it does. Whereas if you're a magistrate, you adjudicate the law. So, so yes, perhaps, perhaps in my absence, more has changed than I realised. Um. So are we going to just be able to like walk in the front door? No. Yes, I was wondering. It's that as well. That also, if is... you have a contract out on you, my friend. Yes. I wonder if we should keep you, or at least as interim, thinking that you are dead. Yes, quite, quite. Uh, it is best that I remain hidden, here, it would seem. But, no, getting into the College of Mages will not be a simple task, for it is well guarded by wardens who do not allow any in or out at the moment. It's only a matter of time, I hear, before they shut the whole place down. Gods know what they're going to do with the mages there, so... I think it would be best that you speak with the High Mage, Esmeralda. She is in charge there. She is a good woman. Uh, I've known her for some time. You can roll me an insight check on that, by the way. <laughs> Rufus is like, mm, nope. I believe everything. 19. Uh, these two probably have something of a something of a history, Zephyr. He does kind of look away for a minute. Uh, as if he's remembering, you know, times gone by. Uh, being being a uh, he like he's, he gets a, a, sig- about, a little bit about relationships. Can Miguel pick up on this? Uh, on a twelve, Miguel probably senses that there's something there. He's not quite sure what that relationship might be. Uh, they definitely okay. know each other. You guys are pretty pretty sure. But yeah, no. Uh, Sergeant Jessica takes a, a apart from his cigarette and some black coffee as he thinks back on all the past cases that he's failed upon. Yeah. So, you seem to be a pretty in the know kind of guy. Is there a way for us to, like, get in without being seen? You know, like one of them back doors or a secret hatch well, or something? I do happen to know someone who might be able to get you inside. Now, oh. in my line of business, I run into a few contacts who have criminal organizational uh, connections, you see, who, uh,. Well, I keep on uh, the pay to get information. One such person is a gnome named Fidget. He is a, uh, a tinkerer of sorts and can get into almost any location. I picked him up a few years ago when he was breaking into the Grand Museum of Neverwinter, trying to steal away with some very important masks. Ever since then, I have fidgeted on my payroll. We've come to an understanding. Any big jobs that are happening in the city, Fidget lets me know about. And if I have the gold, or if I allow Fidget to take a few things from the location I'm looking to get inside, well, Fidget takes his cut. So where would we find this tanker and gnome? Well, uh, it's not far from here, actually. I can give you his house. He lives in a uh, quite a nice mansion, actually. He's grown rich, or <laughs> stealing from. Ooh. I've never seen a mansion before. Is it a gnome-sized mansion? Will I get in the front door? It is a gnome mansion, yes. Oh. He's had it built. Uh, so do you mean it's basically a, like a normal-sized house? It's basically a house, but it is a gnome mansion, yes. Fidget considers himself nobility now that he's stolen enough trinkets and baubles to make himself rich. It's a mansion with a G. <laughs> yes. He, uh, you know, he'll give you the location of that. Okay. Um, and once we get inside the College of Majors, how will we find your friend, Esmeralda? Esmeralda. Well, she is a high mage. Once you're inside, not sure how the mages will react to you being there, so it might be best to remain undercover. Esmeralda will be at the bottom of the tallest tower. She doesn't like to play by tropes. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I look around the table at us. Probably should be the shortest <laughs> tower, really, shouldn't it? We are not the most subtle group of adventurers. We are a wild cards, you might say. Yes, well then, there's hope that Fidget can get you close to that location. 
Yes. Unless you have some other guys. I have to admit that uh, this is subterfuge is not my area of expertise either. I'm more of a... Neither is his mind. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that. Sergeant, you said something about the the wardens and Marcus Pontimus moving against the College of Mages. What's right. the time frame on that? What are we working on here? Day? Week? I believe it happens tomorrow. The taking over of the College of Mages, so we do not have much time. We have today, and well, who knows when they strike. I imagine that they will come early and try and shut the whole place down, arrest them and the like. We should move with haste, then. Agreed. I like that. Yeah. The, group, the group name is Wild Cards. It totally is Wild Cards. <laughs> it card. is Wild Cards. Number oh, play is awesome. Wild Cards. As soon as I said it, I was like, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let's oh. just, hypothetically speaking, my friend, yes. if we get caught, what might happen to the lot of these here wild cards? Well, you're, you would go bust. That's yeah. stopless analogy. Uh, the, no, uh, <laughs> you... Uh, you say bust. <laughs> did somebody say bust? <laughs> Where? Uh, he says... Well, I'm not sure how much I could do. If you fell into the guard force's hands, and I could probably get you out, but if the wardens took you or the mages, then, well, you're on your own. I, we must be careful, then. Why? I think it is time for us to see if our patron has chosen, has drawn her cards wisely for... Yeah, we got to get off this. <laughs> <laughs> we right. Stop yeah. us at once. <laughs> um, yes. Right. Yeah. But well, we the should... horses are ready. Is it a very far trip to see this this here tinker and gnome? Other side of the city in the nobles district. Well, I keep getting really nervous because we keep doing things that are going to get us in trouble. And we always have to worry about being caught. Now we have to worry about being caught for killing the, 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 the circus guy. And we have to be worried about getting caught for killing all those cat people. Shh, no, no, no. Shh. We, he doesn't know. Shh. Kissing all those cat people. Right. Um. And now we have to go to this thing and live. We have to worry about getting caught with that too. And I just thought the list is piling up. It's a lot of things that we could get in trouble for. Farron, life is trouble. <laughs> okay, sure. Um. So, no horses, horses, we're going to go on foot. What's the plan? I think horses, we can't waste the time going on foot. Uh, will there be any problem getting through the gate, my friend? Uh, to the Mages College, you're asking them? Uh, getting through the gate, like, into the city. are we? Because we're, guys, uh, we're no, just outside. Are, the city. No, you guys are kind of in the city at this point with, with, uh, with Mutt's, uh, Mutt is inside oh, the city. Okay, I yeah. didn't realize that Mutt's was true. So, yeah, you, you won't have any trouble getting through. Uh, okay. You already are through. But, yeah, getting into the College of Mages is the So getting to Noble's Quarter isn't a problem. No, getting to like. Noble's Quarter shouldn't be a problem. As long as no one is, like, displaying any signs of, like, obvious magic casting around, then, then that might get you in trouble. Okay. Uh, which also would suggest that he sells things. Uh, if he does have any magic items, then it might be a bit illicit that he's selling that. Um, gotcha. But yeah, uh, so you're heading off on the horses to the nobles district. Yeah. All right, saddle up on the ponies, uh, the pony and the uh, the horses. Oh, they have names now. I named your horses because you failed to do so. So um, yours, Miguel, that is Doolittle. Um, <laughs> Uh, Zephyr, you have Krabby Abby because she's a bit of a wild card. Um, and then, oh, Baron, you get Sunshine. She's just the loveliest pony. And this here, oh. and he points to the tiny one, this is Colossus. <laughs> <laughs> is that one yours? Well, of course. He's the greatest horse that ever lived. <laughs> And I can't even ride him. I walk him the whole way there. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, does he ride you? No, but I carry him. <laughs> Colossus casts a very long shadow as you head out from the uh, uh, Mutt's uh, tavern and heads towards uh, the Nobles There's District. There's no light on for us, Mutt. We will return. I do never turn off my lights. That's just not the kind of person I am. 
just have to shuffle off. <laughs> so you leave that behind. And we're going to head into our second tomb inside of the night at this point before we go to the Nobles District and meet Fidget Lenome with his gnome sized mansion. So we'll be back with the players here in a few minutes' time. Good luck, players. Bye. <laughs> All right then. In fact, let's go. Let's go away from our PowerPoint first of all. Let's go back here into our second arrow point, which is kind of superfluous because I got the the PowerPoint now. But hey, we're gonna create locations for our factions. The first, there it is. The first two minutes that we did, uh, we did uh, location first and then faction. This one we're gonna do faction first and then location. So it's pretty simple. This one's gonna be shorter as well. So don't worry. I'll get back into the action here. So. Creating locations for factions. Um, this is kind of like the wrong way around, right? Because a lot of the time, the classic way of doing this would be to create a location, create a city, create a town, and then think about placing the NPCs in there, creating the factions to put inside it. This way is another way you can go about it, and I wanted to give you guys just a second option, uh, just for extra ideas and extra inspiration, because I find sometimes, you know, one way might work really well for you, uh, but it might work... and you know, really badly for me, it might work really well for me and doesn't work at all for you. So I'll give you a couple of options for when you're creating your faction, your campaign here to see what works best for you guys. Let's go over to our PowerPoint. Uh, so, uh, the wrong way around. Oh my god, this dude. Uh, something I like to do when I fill my world, when I want it to feel like a place which is really lived in, you might create a location, pull a character and it's similar to how NPCs are placed in the video game. Like this guy. What a douchebag. Um, that's, that's... I mean, that's all the slide that I have for that, and I wanted to show the picture of him or anything else. I just wanted to talk about it. Um, so, the way of doing this, I see going around... Uh, the, the best way that I see going around doing this, I suppose, um, would be to create a faction, first of all. You've got a cool idea for who the faction is. You've got this, this dope idea for this group of, I don't know, this group of cool assassins, right? Um, I was inspired recently by playing through uh, the Dishonored franchise, and I was inspired by uh, the assassins in that and the location of Dunwall. So I was like, great, you know, um, let's create a cool band of assassins inspired by this group. So first of all, I had um, the, the faction in mind, right? Um, and then I think about, okay, what kind of place would these guys live in? Um, and of course, inspired by a place like Dunwall, you can create a cool city, you know, a similar vibe to that, a similar feel to that. But that's the kind of basic way about going about it is, you know, think of a cool faction and then you build a location specifically for them uh, rather than trying to fit them and like shoehorn them into a location that maybe they wouldn't be in. Uh, so, for instance, you've got this cool city that you have, maybe it's like a standard fantasy city. Uh, but you're trying to shoe in, ho shoehorn in this extra faction in here and you're trying to get this other faction here and all these factions in the same place. Um, which can be cool, right? There's definitely ways of doing that. Different districts of the city could be cool. But creating uh, their own location for a faction is super fun as well. I had this idea recently for a campaign about this faction of uh, like marsh folk people uh, who walk upon stilts. I had this really cool image in my mind uh, of these, I must have seen a piece of artwork somewhere, uh, for this group of like stilt walkers who like go through the marshes and through the bogs uh, and it was Mad Max, totally like, it was, it was a shot in Mad Max. Uh, and they go like fishing through the marshes and they walk through the stilts to get through it, right? Uh, and I was like, great, you know, we need to build, I need to build a location specifically for this group because they're that cool. I took that seed of inspiration and then I built this, this, this cool like marsh town, basically, which is all built up around this one bog uh, and this one kind of like central bog tree, which they all kind of uh, live from. And it, and it's like magical. So there was like swamp water coming out from the tree and it was all dope. And I found myself really inspired by doing this because I had this one image of like a, a character in my mind and then I built the town and the city up around that. Rather than building a city first and not having an idea of who might live in it. Uh, and, and that's really important I think because when you think about cities, they are characteristic of the people who live in them. So uh, looking across history, you know, like Roman cities look a, a, lot, a lot different from uh, you know, like Persian cities. So you've got like a difference in architecture and the difference of what those towns and cities look like a lot of the time because different people lived in them. Uh, and that's something to bear in mind, I think, when, you, when you're creating your world, when you're creating your town. Uh, who lives in it 
And what does it look like because these people live in it? So going with these swamp people, you know, they live in this swamp and they're, you know, they live here, which means that there has to be a swamp here somewhere. Um, and does it mean that all of the houses are actually raised up on stilts as well? Because there's a, there's a bog everywhere and that everyone, you know, walks around in stilts all the time. Uh, is it that this city is actually a flying city and everyone uh, is like in the sky? In which case, what does that look like? Because it's a flying city, uh, there must be a, maybe a group of celestial angels or people who can fly, maybe super steampunk. What does the city look like to reflect the people that live in it? Because rather than the characters being a reflection of the city, if that makes sense. So uh, with a town, with a city like Neverwinter, there's a lot you can do with it. Um, for instance, in the, the realms, we're going to get to a couple of different districts and see how we've changed them. Uh, we're going to get to the noble district and see what that looks like here in a minute. We're going to go to the College of Mages and see what that looks like as well, because we're going to do some different things with that. Um, but that's a, just a different way of going about it, I think. Just Think of a cool faction or a cool character and then build a place for them and then build out from that. And that's a lot of what world building is. It's starting at a small location that you're really inspired by and then building out and expanding from that starting point. So that's a couple of tips about that. Hopefully that was a little bit helpful um, for factions and, and ideas. Let's get some ideas for an orc city. I like the sound of an orc city. Maybe we'll do a quick bit of ideas, uh, an idea jam uh, for an orc city. Um, Let's do that next week. I will get a PowerPoint ready next week. My PowerPoint presentation next week. We'll, 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 uh, we'll touch on some Orc cities and see what they might be up to because they're a faction that could be really interesting, I think. And uh, a little bit, you know, you know uh, we don't see them so much a lot in the realms. And certainly a lot of campaigns that I've played in, I haven't had Orcs as a major faction. So I'd quite like to do that now that you mention it. So, all right. Um, let us let us head back to the, uh, the party and uh, let's see what they're up to over there. All right then, so we are back with the party here in our uh, next section of plays. We're in the city of Neverwinter. We're headed over to meet with Fidget the Gnome. And uh, go ahead, Tosco. Look how you got a question there. Just housekeeping wise, while you were doing two men's sight, uh, from the four potions that I got from Sindra, Sil Sindra Sil Sylvain, I always mess up her yes. name. So everyone has one, and then I figure I'll keep the two uh, mm -hmm. and the snail just so Theoretically, I'm trying to keep myself alive so I can heal you if I have to. <laughs> and then everyone else has, so everyone has one, just to, housekeeping wise, so you know where they are. So everyone has a healing, one healing potion, and then I've got two real, one stale. Beautiful. That works for me. So um, you're headed through the city uh, and head towards the Nobles Canton uh, in which you are set to meet with Fidget and Gnome. Uh, you notice around here that uh, if you've ever been to Neverwinter like 10 years ago, that it used to look a lot better around here. Uh, it is now fairly dilapidated. Um, the siege and the uh, wars that have come to this place uh, are definitely taking their toll on all of the city and all of the wealth in the city as well. So uh, where normally you would see, you know, like nobles just strolling around on these perfectly clean streets uh, and there being like street cleans around, now you see, um, you know, like beggar children running around uh, in the streets and, you know, the, the, the doors and the shutters being up in noble houses uh, because the city is clearly going through a, a difficult time. Uh, even on a couple of, you know, street corners, you'll see some dodgy looking fellows. Um, who look like they probably, you know, uh, are protection for people around here, the racketeers. So um, you head through this uh, canton and you come to uh, Fidget's house. Uh, it is a large house um, for a gnome-sized home, but you can definitely tell that this was built specifically for gnomes because the doors and the windows and basically everything about it, the structure, is small. Uh, they have created it just to fit for gnomes. It looks way too small for Rufus to easily fit inside there. Um, but despite that fact, it is still large. You can see that the ceilings are high in it because it's a grand kind of building uh, and they, they've built it to be, you know, luxuriant and wealthy. Um, and uh, there's there's no one inside it. You can see at the moment there are lights on in there, so it looks like people are home. Um, and yeah, you step up towards what you, uh, you know, to be Fidget's house. I'll knock on the door. Nice. Uh, you uh, knock on the door. A few moments later, <laughs> you stoop down to knock on it. A few moments later, a, uh, a gnome appears. Uh, he looks very, um, uh, very like well-dressed uh, for a gnome. He's wearing a, a tuxedo. Um, and uh, he's wearing these uh, like tinted glasses, which, which are black. Um, to, 
basically sunshades um, to, to protect his eyes from serious sun. Uh, and looks uh, at the... All right, what up? I am looking for the esteemed and renowned Fidget the Gnome. Fidget, Fidget, Fidget the Gnome. Fidget the Gnome, Fidget the Gnome. Pleased to meet you, Fidget the Gnome. That is me. I am Fidget the Gnome. What can I do you for? Who can I do you for? What can I do? Why are you oh, here? What do you want? We hear that you have a friend that uh, you uh, once in a while get tips from to uh, gain your wonderful wealth and uh, establishment here. Perhaps we should speak uh, inside your lovely home instead of here on the street. Ah, oh, did he send you, did he? The old one. He, he did, in fact. Yeah, he turns up his nose. Fine, you can come inside, I guess. Don't break my door! He shouts at Rufus. Come on in. Am I, am I actually going to be able to fit through it? You you can squeeze through. You're going to have to get, like, on your hands and knees. <laughs> Rufus, do you need me to put oil on you? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah oil me up. <laughs> okay. Squeeze yeah, me like, through. Yeah, and it's like, put some oil in her hand. It's like rubbing it on Rufus. And she's like, now we'll just squeeze. Uh -huh. Just, I can wait outside with yeah. just, You know, we could wait outside, I guess, and make watch, make sure nobody follows us. Oh, oh. We, I can wait with you, Rufus. He looks at Farron. Why don't you go ahead with Miguel? I'll wait with the big man. Yeah, we'll wait out here. You go, you're so charming, Farron. Maybe the little gnome will like you. I look at, uh, I look at Farron and was like, I did not know you were so adept with your hands and with oil. I will keep that in mind. Oh, what is, is it the no, this no fidget? And she like um wipes her hand off a little bit like on her shirt and like extends it to you to take it as you walk into the I house. I put my arm out graciously as we I assume all but have to get on our knees to go through this door. Yeah, and escort her in. It's just like um yeah, I've, I've been um I've been doing things with with oil for a a while. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> tell me hey, the wondrous hey. things that you have done with oil and your friend Rufus. I have um, I have some stories I can uh, we can talk about uh, later. And she's not trying to insinuate anything at all. She doesn't realize that this is sort of an yeah. innuendo. And he's just like, like oh, he's got a raised eyebrow. I'm not sure if I can com compete with such a man as Rufus, but we have this oh. and. Uh, <laughs> We follow Fidget to wherever he leads us. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, Fidget uh, leads you inside his pretty grand home. Um, he's got all sorts of, uh, you know, like paintings, decorations, artifacts around. This is clearly a very wealthy little gnome. He steps through past servants. Uh, all right, all right. And he uh, kind of lets you into a, uh, like an office room, basically. Uh, he's got a desk down there uh, and uh, tons of like artifacts and books around him. So what do you want? We need to get we need to get into the College of Mages with some haste. Hopefully undetected by the wardens who apparently have set up guard around it. Really? Is that so? And that is what that guy, what his name he is he's told you to do that, has he? Yes, he said we're supposed to have a contact in there. Um Mon Esmeralda. Uh, he shrugs noncommittally. Yeah, what's in it for me then? Because I to... am, I am Fidget the Gnome. Fidget the Gnome, Fidget the Gnome. So what am I supposed to do? Why am I doing this? What is in it for me? I suppose would be my main question. Why am I doing this for you when I don't even know your goddamn name? Well, I am Miguel Ortonava. What is I'm that very pleased to. I'm very pleased to meet you and see your magnificent collection here. It comes to mind that someone with such an amazing collection as this would certainly want to always expand that collection. And what better to be a capstone piece on such amazing items if it weren't amazing magical items? I would assume that while I have, while we are speaking with the head mage, Esmeralda, that once we are all inside, 
we have no concern where you might go, what you might find, or what might happen to find its way somehow, be misplaced within this tumultuous time at the mage's tower. Tell me a persuasion check, yeah. You can gain advantage on it, he really wants you to. That's a 19, and thank goodness. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Holy, that is lucky, yeah. Uh, He's like, ha. Well, I suppose I could do with a couple new trinkets around. I am fidget, I am fidget, I am fidgetly known. So, uh, all right, maybe I can. Ain't going to be easy, though. It's going to cost you up front as well. How much do you need? Well, I'm going to need materials, love, ain't I? I'm going to need some materials to get us in there. Because it ain't going to be easy. Ain't going to be easy. But I am fidget and home. So, perhaps I could do it. But, first of all, I'm going to need a uh, front-up investment to show that you're uh, you're being real, you know? So, what you got? Um, it's fair. It's like sort of like looking in her pockets for stuff. Uh, I have, um... Have some uh, gold. I have some gold pieces. I have a, a. I have a dead rose. If you might talk. No. Uh, do I look like a man who needs gold or dead roses? I, well, I it's, it's kind of sentimental. Like it's probably. Oh, okay. One moment. I go outside, and go into our friend Rufus's barrel, and get out the nasty serpent thing and bring it in and go. I have one of the serpent tattoos. Oh, hello, hello, hello. What a beauty. What a rare beauty this is. What the hell is this? (laughs) Uh, We got it out of a a dead cat person's arm. All right. Apparently these live underneath the tattoos of the Red Shades in the Zentrum. Right. Okay. Well, we found out the hard way. I see. I see. Well, uh, have a look here. And he kind of takes it and, uh, and, and and begins to sort of examine it. He puts on like a little monocle to take a look at it, like he's inspecting jewellery. Uh, you get a little lens on his eye. Ah, oh, that seems to be pretty good to me. Yeah. All right. Seems like you're serious about this and magical weird stuff, and that's my speciality, you see, I love that. So, I'll try and get you inside the college. In return, you let me loose on there, and I take anything what I see. Deal? He extends his little gnome hand. Deal. Deal. That was easy. (laughs) Good. Well, it just so happens that I've been planning a job on the Mages College for a while. I hear that they don't have much left, much longer left before all those uh, wardens lot come on in there. And well, they don't like exactly uh, the sort of thing what I get up to, you see. And you want to loot it before uh, the others do? Exactly. Because once they get in there, it's going to be a whole lot tougher to break in and nick all the stuff what I want to nick, isn't it? So. Right. A couple of routes we could go with this. Personally, I'm a big fan of excavations and explosions. Messy entrances, of course, but uh, quick and fun. Or it's going to take us a lot longer because I've got to go talk to a guy about a teleportation circle uh, because the other won't be a teleportation circle. But that wouldn't be ready until tomorrow. Mm. That is cutting it close from what we hear of when this all is supposed to occur. Will this explosion look to be of natural causes, or will they know that they are under siege? Uh, how many natural caused explosions have you seen, mate? Not many, but it's Call of the Mages. I can't imagine that you don't have students maybe miss fire <laughs> every once in a while, perhaps? Or is this going to be all hands on deck and we are going to have all of the wardens and guards in the city fall upon us. I mean, for something like that, we could try and make it look like the alchemy lab's blown up, something like that. Have the explosion by that lab, and, well, reasonable enough to assume that something might have gone wrong with them majors there, innit? And that could be fun. Ooh, ooh, we have a, f- 
friend who's really good at uh, setting things on fire and burning them to the ground. That, that is my kind of friend. I'd like to meet that friend of yours. Yeah, he's outside, and he actually just did... Um, he pro- I mean, talked about with information. Yeah, yeah I remember. Are you I talking actually... about that fire down just outside Level Window, that carnival? No. You're lying. Yes. <laughs> uh... Interesting. So... That is interesting. So who exactly are you going burning down carnivals and working with Sergeant Tasker? Oh, well... We are, we are the Wild Guards. <laughs> yeah, wild I guess cards. we have a name. I like that. All right, Wild Cards, you got yourself a deal. So, which is it going to be? Explosion? <laughs> or teleportation circle? I am never one to deny a man of his fun, whatever it may be. All right, then. Then it's sorted. We'll be back here at nightfall. I'll get going. Very good. Do you know of an uh, interesting place where we can uh, bide our time until, we, until this evening? There are a lot of interesting places around here. What kind of things interest you? I look at him with a smile. You are Fidget the Gnome. I am Morgello Tanava. Everything interests me. The more exotic, the better. Mm. Uh, he, uh, he, like, turns his nose up. He's like, well, some good museums you could try nicking some stuff from around here. Someone mentioned masks at a, a museum. Ah, yeah. Yeah, that was my, uh, well, mistake. My one mistake. You're allowed one. Of course. Well, what, those, what do you mean exactly? Those masks are what got me caught in it. So when Tasca caught me, and now I'm working with him, innit? They are very beautiful masks, those ones. He kind of leans in. You're clearly talking about his, like, pet passion. Uh, right. Yeah, those masks particularly, uh, beautiful they have powers beyond that of most people but they're protected by the wardens you see you know rumor has it that if you can wear that mask disappear completely vanished like with magic and only when you take it off will people see you and even then they see what you want them to see for the masks have great many powers unfortunately for us they are holed up between 20 meters of concrete and 100 wardens or so ever since they caught me i got out well, don't worry did my time you know community service and you're in debt you're in debt in to uh, our friend sergeant tasker perhaps we maybe should just tour the city maybe get a layout of where these wardens seem to be concentrated so that we will be able to... In fact, that is something you might be able to help me with, help all of us with. All right. I'm helping you a lot already, though, aren't I? Well, how are you planning on getting out? There will be, perhaps with us, quite a few mages that we need to move out of Neverwinter in a invisible manner without having such things as these masks. I didn't know that was part of the job, did I? You need to get invisible mages out, or mages invisibly out. Where do you need to get them to? I don't know where we are from Mutt. So is that like a poor quarter? Is that the ports? I'm sorry. Yeah, Where's you're, Mutt? Down, you're down by the docks, basically, with Mutts. Okay. So it would be quite um, easy across the sea. To, we're going to try to get them to the docks. Get him to the dock, all right. Well, I guess we could see about maybe some kind of uh, disguise or cover for him because you can't just walk a bunch of maidens with their pointy hats and sticks and wands and all that out just walking about. The wardens will have them for breakfast, won't they? So we have to, you know, put him in something else. Make him look like, I don't know, guards or servers or something like that. Oh, uh, you are a well-dressed man. Are there any events occurring in the city this evening? I guess we could go to something. 
know that the mages could be oh. dressed for. Well, yeah, there's any ma number of soirees. In fact, I could be throwing one myself. Ooh, that's going to be really fun. Well, you're not invited. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fun for the other people that are invited. Yeah, that is the plan. You, so it'll be fun for us who want to go in. You, my friend, you are a man who appreciates a mask. And you, I bet, know how to throw one hell of a party. What do you think about putting on a masquerade this evening for all of the nobles of the, of the city? All right. I guess that could be fun. And then... Maybe we will just join all the rest who are coming to fidget the gnomes masked, marvelous masked masquerade. That is a lot of M's. I, I like that, that is quite a few. Perhaps I took it a little bit too far. A little bit too far, maybe, yeah. A little bit too far. Yes, but I'm sure that you know how to market far better than me. I am a foreigner. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, in our case... Could you perhaps... Maybe, do you know, are the mages allowed to leave the tower now? Are they being held within, under house arrest, so to speak? Yeah, they ain't getting in or out of that place. Ah. Uh, Not unless they teleport or something like that, of course, but I reckon they're being watched. Yes. Ooh. So we need to invite the people that would be watching them. You want to invite the wardens here to my house, to Fidget the Gnome's house? Well... You know, yeah. there's, a, the, the, there's a bloody police, love, out there. And I've got about a million gold pieces worth of stolen goods in here. I mean... Well, see, what's a better way to throw off the, their suspicion than to just invite them and throw it right in front of their face? They won't expect anything. I'll tell you what a better way of doing that is, is not inviting them into my bloody house. I would have to agree, my dear. Um, that perhaps... <laughs> Oh, this is why I said I should have stayed outside. Oh, no, you're doing wonderfully. You're doing wonderfully. Um, I give her the smile. Just if we can get... You know, I assume that when large parties happen around the city, you, you might have uh, a custom to have the guards look the other way in case things get a little rowdy, a little uh, illicit... Uh, sure, sure. Things a little stronger than drink might be passed around that we might not normally have at such a, you know, the, the, the law might not look Yeah, pleasant. no, we do a lot of grade A drugs, actually. Well, there you have it. So, uh, perhaps maybe just a normal party with masks that you throw and spread around the normal coin you would spread to have the law keep the way. Business as usual. All but right. Lots of people in the streets coming to your wonderful party in masks. I like it. Tell you what, you could do me a favor and pick up my uh, my delivery, wink, wink, by which I mean of class A drugs. Of course, we are friends in this, are we not? Exactly, so you will do the deal, wink, wink, by which I mean give them the money what I give you to get my class A drugs. Who Just exactly so will I be dealing with his interim? That is my only question. No, 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 no. He's a mate of mine. Oh, of course that I will. You do us a favor, we do you a favor. All right. I'm sure that you can make this party like none other and insist everyone wear masks. You, uh, you see him as he gets this, like, parcel, brown paper parcel out and, like, slides what's clearly, you know, like, gold pieces uh, of, of gold across... It'll be just opposite the street. Uh, perfect then. All right, I'll be seeing you then. Lots of love. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. You're not gone. Bye bye. I'm making this. Is, this is a hit. Goodbye. 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 Bye. Goodbye, my friend. And yep. He uh, <laughs> he lets you outside. Shows you out. Uh, Zephyr Rufus uh, yeah. watches Miguel and Farron return. Farron looks at Rufus, uh, not Rufus, uh, Miguel, and says, So are we going to the party or not? We are 
going to have put all of the mages in masks. And instead of attending, or look as though we have just attended and then continue on our way back way so that hopefully we'll be able to mingle with everybody else. Okay. Most of I the see. are probably well known. This way, they if everyone is wearing a mask and everyone is in disguise, then no one is. Great. I'm invisible in a crowd. Much oh, like that's going to be so fun. <laughs> so oh, when you guys... Uh, hi. <laughs> So when you guys come out to uh, join us, you catch the tail end of Zephyr holding up a small bottle of oil, and he says, so you just rub it on your thighs, and they just, don't chafe anymore. Right, it's just oil on the inside. You gotta really get into crevices, though, because if you miss some crevices, they get dry and they'll crack. Oh, right, right. All right, just a little bit. Yeah. She's something like a thimbleful. Right. Rufus is gingerly petting his pony, his tiny pony, while this conversation's happening. Yep. Uh, that's it, and you just, that's why I get um, Farron to help me, because even though I'm a pretty dexterous gentleman, there are some parts that just, you, I can't quite <laughs> reach on my own. Right, you, you, you need eyes on it, you need yeah. like, right. Yeah. Everything's better with friends. Spot me. Friends that can keep a secret. I cannot agree more, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how'd it go talking to the little one? We Please. have a Having plan. a party? We're going to a party. I've never been to a party. We'll be going um, to an explosion. Um, yeah, we don't really get to party with everyone else. So what are we doing? Uh, we need Zephyr to uh, do that whole burn the place to the ground thing that he does really well. I, well, now you've got I good use for that all. I think Fidget is taking care of all of the burning to the ground and explosions. Oh. Yeah, I'm not oh, and we you. have to pick up drugs. What? That I did, we did agree to. I explained to them the uh, the plan, uh, basically, that we are going to blow up the alchemy lab, get into the mage's quarters with Fidget, let Fidget is, we're not going to worry about what Fidget does. We need to take with us, we need to go buy masks. I have, right. Do we have any idea how many mages we're dealing with? Mm. From the list from you, can, you can roll like a history check. On Syndra, 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 Syndra. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Sure. Let me roll that history check. Just three. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, there are definitely some mages in the mages college. Ah. Uh. So, I, we will get, we should get enough for plenty. Um, but anyway, so we have, I look at the two of them. My friends, you get to shop um, as we need to procure masks for ourselves and whatever mages we are trying to sneak out. Oh. I apparently need to go pick up drugs for the party. Yeah, you see like there's a dark alley opposite you. There's like, there's a shadowy figure there probably waiting. I look to uh, Zephyr. Uh, would you like to join me, my friend? I am not sure what I've gotten myself into. Yeah, me neither. Um, for a moment, he walks over towards Rufus and just acts like he's getting something off of uh, what's my Krabby Abby. <laughs> and as as when he gets close enough to Rufus, he sort of whispers in Rufus's ear and says, "Next time we're going in, they can stay out here. We well, can't mess up as bad as they have." He whispers back, "Let's hope the doors are bigger." Right. <laughs> he turns. I'm coming. Right. Right. No whispering yeah. here. Guess I'll just <laughs> wait here with the horses. I'll wait here too. Um, <laughs> so, I, kinda, I don't really want to go down there. It's very scary. All right, okay. Peacock. Let's do your dream. Miguel and Zephyr head down. All right. I don't know what we are going to face here, but hopefully it is just a transaction. You uh, you see a large shadowy figure who's kind of like hiding in the darkness here, back to you. Um, looks to be, you know, like, could be like six six and a half, maybe even seven feet tall. Uh, and um, it's kind of like, <clears throat> got like kind of calling you over, you know? I uh, head over with Zephyr at my side. I call yeah, Zephyr, Zephyr's looking up around all over the place. Calls over from his shoulder, looking <clears throat> for some ducks. I, uh, my, uh, a, a, a friend much smaller than you has sent me for his parcel. Why? Right. 
the figure kind of turns round and the darkness will cowl up, hands you some, hands you this package. There you go. I put some, I, I put, I, I put some extra stuff in it because I thought it would be nice to include it. You know. Matt. Matt. What? How did you? That's not my name. <clears throat> It's Mutt, isn't it? <laughs> it's absolutely Mutt selling you drugs in a dark corner of Neverwinter. And of course, that's what we're going to wrap up our session for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just do, I give him a giant hug as soon as I realize it's him. <laughs> yeah, Zephyr joins in on that one too. <laughs> uh, oh, he's got... He's... I love Mutt. Mutt for life. <laughs> well, my friends, that's where we're going to end tonight's session of Learn by Play. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. A lot of fun, as always, here. Uh, it's been great to be here. Thanks so much to Wizard of Coast for letting us be here on the channel every Saturday. Come back same time next week for more. Every Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Come over, watch some Learn by Play of us. And you can go watch the other ones on YouTube as well. Uh, also, uh, if you guys want to uh, join us for more Dungeons & Dragons, then you can do... Pop on over to uh, Encounter Roleplay over on Twitch. I'll drop a link for you guys. You can uh, follow us over there for more Dungeons and Dragons. But it is so much fun being here on the Learn by Play channel. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys learned a couple of things as well. I picked up a few tips, got some inspiration. I had a lot of fun. Let's get around the cast and crew. Did we enjoy ourselves? Uh, Tall School, what do you think about tonight's show, my friend? I had a great time, as always. Miguel is a lot of fun to play. Um, I, I, again, wonderful NPCs. And I just... I. Mutt. What can you say? Mutt's just the man. It's like I, I, I'm totally thinking that you know, if we can have like Mutt and Mutt and Sarge Tasker be you know at, at HQ, yeah, you know, I'm like all for it. I ship, I ship uh, Rufus and Mutt so hard though. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're like they're like kindred spirits. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. it was amazing. It's amazing. But anyway, you guys, uh, if you uh, want to find me elsewhere around social media, you can find me on uh, Twitter is the easiest way to go, uh, at Tall Squall. Uh, just type it in. And my top link that is pinned there has links to all the other things I do, including running a campaign for charity at 2 o'clock on Saturday and uh, the fun and excitement that is Turn Cloaks uh, podcast that happens on Mondays and Tuesdays. It is an interesting time over there. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you uh, find me somewhere else, let me know that you found me on uh, Learn by Play. Great stuff. Sydney. Uh, yes, I'm excited for the party. I'm excited for the drugs. Um, <laughs> a lot of things are happening. It's very fun, very reminiscent of a freshman year. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm Sydney. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, here at Zidiac, and I'm the Dungeon Master for Wonder Quest, which is a Dungeons and Dragons podcast. If you just can't get enough, you can go listen to that, and I'll link it in the chat as well. So come hang out with me there. Good stuff. Greg. Oh, I had a blast. Love playing with these people. Love your story, Will. Love being on D&D, playing with Wizards of the Coast. See you guys back here next Saturday at 6 to 9 Eastern, playing a little bit more Zephyr. If you want to follow me, Grimjack21502 on Twitch and Twitter. Like uh, Tall said, if you saw me on Learn, let me know there, and we'll chat about whatever you'd like. Until next time, though. Great stuff. And Chelsea? As usual, it is a humbling experience to play with a lot of these incredible uh, this cast and uh, just to be here and do this. So I always have a good time. Um, it's it's not hard for me to have a good time. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, if you want to check me out or you like what I'm throwing down, you can catch me on all the social medias at little underscore red underscore dot. Uh, you can check out my Twitter and see all the many things that I do when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons, including being over on ERP's channel um, and a podcast as well called North by Northwest. So if, uh, you know, come check me out. Let, let me know what you think. And uh, I'm sure I'll be on that social media to, to chat it up. Great stuff, great stuff. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, it has been a great time, as always. And uh, until next time, my friends. I'm trying to throw too many net ones because we want to be here laughing when you do. Uh. I was muted on Zoom, so they didn't hear me say my <laughs> outro. Yeah, we're like. <laughs> Where did it go? I fade out. We'll, cut, we'll edit this in post. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> uh.